YouTube, by the way. So we'll give you, we'll give you all that information. I am live now. There's a scary thought. So anyway, good morning. For, for everybody who doesn't know me, I'm Karen Stephenson, and I'm a nurse practitioner at Mount Sinai. I'm also in charge of the patient navigation and survivorship program there. I want to welcome you to our second annual um, oncology symposium. Uh, hope you like the venue. One of the reasons we changed, we thought it was kind of centrally located. So I just want to go over a couple of um, uh, housekeeping hints for this morning. Um, bathrooms are down that hallway past where the poker tournament is on the right hand side. Okay? There's an updated agenda which includes a break from 10 to 10.45 and then a lunch break from 12.30 to one, about 1.30 and then at about 2 o'clock there'll be um, snacks for, for an afternoon break but not a formal break that'll be in the back of the room. Okay, any questions, comments? Warm enough, cold enough? Whoops. There. That. And there's bathrooms over there as well. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Julia. Okay, so our first speaker is Dr. Alyssa Krill Jackson. So um, Dr. Krill went to medical school at the University of Michigan, did her residency at Brigham and Women's, her fellowship at UM and New England Medical Center in Boston. She is the medical co-director of our breast oncology program and the director of genetic counseling program at Mount Sinai, and her topic is updates in breast cancer and information from the San Antonio Breast Conference. Dr. Krill. Uh, hi, um, I'm Elisa Krill Jackson, um, and what we're going to talk about today is how do I forward my slides? Do I have a? Well, I need my clicker. Actually, you can also do this is forward, this is back. This here is a little red dot if you want to refer ah, to that. Beautiful. All right. Um, what we're going to talk about is um, advances in breast cancer over the last year and and new updates that that we should all know about. Um, I need to disclose that I, I get honoraria from uh, Eli Lilly and from Pfizer for speaking. Um, so what we're going to talk about initially, gosh, I wish I had my uh, computer in front of me so I don't have to look up here. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about adjuvant therapy of, of breast cancer initially and, and the updates in, in adjuvant therapy. We're going to talk a little bit about chemo prevention, um, uh, local therapy uh, um, updates, um, updates in HER2 positive breast cancer, hormone receptor positive disease, and triple negative breast cancer. So this you can see the breast cancer subtypes by age, and what I really want you to notice is that ERP or positive breast cancer is the most common type of breast cancer in all age groups. However, it, it's much more prevalent in, in older populations. And the triple negative, which is of course our most problematic type, is largest in our youngest age groups. 23% of patients um, under the age of 40 who have breast cancer will have HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, I mean, it's triple negative breast cancer, I'm sorry. And HER2 positive breast cancer, again, is much more common in younger age groups. Now, we see more triple negative in younger age groups, of course, because there we have a predominance of, of genetic mutations. So BRCA mutations predispose to younger breast cancer, and they also predispose to triple negative breast cancer. Um, African Americans tend to have more triple negative breast cancer as well. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about chemo prevention for intraepithelial neoplasia. So intraepithelial neoplasia is um, a long word for um, what we've known as either ductal carcinoma in situ or um, atypical hyperplasia. So these are all a spectrum of intraepithelial neoplasia. And we know that they increase the risk for um, infiltrating, du infiltrating ductal carcinoma. So we have multiple agents that we can use for chemo prevention. We can use the aromatase inhibitors. We can use Avista in postmenopausal women. 
we can use tamoxifen. But those all are associated with a lot of side effects that people find unappealing. I mean, we know with the aromatase inhibitors, they cause a lot of arthralgias, vaginal dryness, osteoporosis, um, vistas, again, hot flashes, and tamoxifen can increase the risk of uterine cancer and hot flashes. So a study was done actually looking at um, lower doses of tamoxifen to see if they'd be more tolerable but just as effective because the 20 milligram dose we've been studying for years and years without actually any good data on do you really need 20 milligrams. And so in this trial, uh, they randomized low dose tamoxifen. Now this dose was five milligrams a day. Tamoxifen does not come as a five milligram pill. It does come as a 10 milligram pill. Um, available um, on the market now. And they took uh, women at higher risk for breast cancer who had intraepithelial neoplasia. They could have had um, atypical ductal hyperplasia, LCIS, or DCIS. And they randomized them to tamoxifen 5 milligrams a day or placebo. There were 500 subjects enrolled. Now, this is a much smaller trial than, than the um, um, uh, P1 prevention trial, which randomized like 6,000 women, but again, it's, it's a decent sized trial. And they treated them only for three years, not for five years. And what you can see here is a marked decrease in breast cancer events. This is the line of the women who got tamoxifen, and this is um, uh, disease free um, in the women who, who didn't get tamoxifen um, in the five milligram group. There was a 50% reduction in breast cancer events in women who got the five milligrams a day of tamoxifen, which is sorry, technical difficulties. So there was um, a, quite a reduction, um, actually more, more like a 75% reduction for three years of tamoxifen in women who got the five milligram a day dose. Um, and that's very, very similar to what we saw in the, the, the P1 trial, which uh, was a 50% reduction in that 6,000 women on that trial. Um, adverse events were very, very minimal. And there was one endometrial cancer on the tamoxifen arm, and that was it. There was one DVT on each arm, um, and, and no increase in deaths at all. Um, so this appears to be a good alternative to 20 milligrams of tamoxifen for prevention. And I think that uh, women are just much more accepting of it. I mean, I've, I've prescribed it to several women already since this data came out at San Antonio in December. And women were just thrilled that they could take a lower dose of tamoxifen. Um, again, in the study, it showed much less hot flashes, which is one of people's biggest complaints with tamoxifen. So I think it's a really good alternative for women with DCIS or with um, atypical ductal hyperplasia or just a high risk for breast cancer looking for an option that has, um, that's associated with less side effects to reduce their risk. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about chemotherapy uh, de-escalation. So as you know, our standard of care for patients with um, large HER2-positive cancers is Taxotere, Carboplatin, Herceptin, and Progetta for six cycles, which is fairly toxic, certainly causes hair loss. For stage one cancers, we can also give 12 weeks of Taxol, Herceptin, but again, causes hair loss chemotherapy. So um, the Christine trial was done, which compared the chemo regimen with with her uh, trastuzumab and pertuzumab to a regimen with TDM1. I think we're all familiar with TDM1. It's a Herceptin conjugated with metansine chemo, so it's really um, um, like a Trojan horse. It brings the chemo into the cell through the Herceptin. Uh, but it's, it's really a, a non-chemo. It doesn't cause chemo side effects, doesn't cause hair loss, doesn't cause a lot of nausea, combined with pertuzumab. And so this was looking for a non-chemotherapy regimen um, that we could use um, as in a neoadjuvant setting for breast cancer. Um, and what they found was that it was actually not quite as good as the chemo regimen, but was much less toxic. So, you know, even though this is not going to be a superior regimen, it is an alternative, perhaps, for patients who refuse a chemotherapy option or maybe are not candidates for a chemotherapy option. Maybe somebody with a severe peripheral neuropathy already who you don't want to give a taxane to. Now, approval, you know, getting an insurance to pay for it is, is going to be somewhat diff difficult, but this is looking like a, a non-chemo option. Maybe not as good, but a non-chemo option for patients. 
Um, now, the big news at, at San Antonio this year um, was this trial. So this is the Catherine trial, which we participated in. And the um, Catherine trial used TDM1, trastuzumab imtansine, um, in patients who got neoadjuvant chemotherapy who did not have a pathologic complete response. So these patients got AC, Taxol, Herceptin, or TCH, or even TCHP. They had their surgery. They still had some residual disease in their breast. And it could be microscopic residual disease. They could have had one millimeter of residual disease. We know that patients who have a pathologic complete response have a very, very good prognosis, more than a 90% chance that they will not have a disease recurrence. But um, patients who have residual disease, and depending on the amount of residual disease, um, they have a worse prognosis. So what this trial did is it randomized women to either finish their year of Herceptin or after surgery to be switched to TDM1, to this monoclonal antibody conjugated with the chemo. Um, that does not cause hair loss, but can cause some side effects like thrombocytopenia, elevated liver functions, rarely a little bit of, of fever or nausea. And so, so it randomized them in a one-to-one -one fashion to TDM1 for 14 cycles or to continue their trastuzumab for 14 cycles. And the endpoint was invasive disease-free survival. And what you can see here, what I want you to look at is, is this is the disease-free survival on TDM1, and this is the disease-free survival on trastuzumab. There's a big difference there. So just by switching T, um, trastuzumab to TDM1, we got a lot more um, patients salvaged not having a recurrence of their breast cancer. Um, and what you should look here is it worked both in patients who were estrogen receptor negative, estrogen receptor positive, patients who got pertuzumab also benefited as opposed to those that just got trastuzumab. It benefited node negative patients as well as node positive patients, all age subgroups, um, all races, and all size of tumors. So if you look here at tumors that were T1A, less than five millimeters, they, they had almost the same benefit in terms of decreased recurrence risk. So this is, this is the big news, and we're, right now we're waiting for an approval. Um, I don't see any issues since this drug is already an approved drug that we use for metastatic disease. So we're waiting for an approval from the FDA, but um, insurers at this point are already agreeing to cover this for, for patients who don't have a pathologic complete response. Um, now, um, I want to look at the Extinet study. This is an older study that we'd been using in patients who'd finished a whole year of trastuzumab, but we felt were higher risk, um, randomizing them to a whole nother year of neratinib or placebo. And if you're familiar with neratinib, it's an oral HER2 inhibitor. It causes a lot of diarrhea. It's very difficult. It makes the treatment go from one year to two years. And it did decrease the recurrence risk. 90% to 87.7% in the total population of patients. But if you compare that to the, the study before, look at the big difference there. So it looks like TDM1 is, is a much more effective way to salvage patients who don't have a pathologic complete response to um, uh, chemo. Yes? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with exactly how many patients were on the study. The neratinib seemed to only really benefit patients with ER positive disease. It didn't have a great benefit on ER negative disease. Um, so so there's, there's some issues. So, you know, unfortunately, I, for, for, um, for neratinib, I think this is not going to be where they pick up a lot of business in the future, although we do expect it to be approved for metastatic disease, for which it's, it's quite useful and um, it, it does get into the brain. Um, the safety of, this is the safety of TDM1, very safe. If you're used to giving this drug, women tolerate it generally very, very well. So, so what's the meaning of this study? Um, should we recommend TDM1 for patients who got pertuzumab as their neoadjuvant therapy and did not have a pathologic complete response? I'd say the answer to that is definitely yes. 
it's, it shows benefit in all subgroups of patients. Should we continue pertuzumab with it? No, there's no data for continuing pertuzumab. And what about patients with low volume disease? I think e even in low volume disease, we see a marked increase in metastatic disease in patients who don't have a pathologic complete response. So even if somebody has a few millimeters of residual disease, I think it is worth switching them. And what about neratinib? I think neratinib is extended adjuvant therapy, um, and people at San Antonio felt that this was an inferior option to um, switching to TDM1. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the Taylor X study. So, um, as you know, um, we the Taylor X study was reported this year. So, Taylor X study looked at using an Oncotype DX assay to evaluate whether patients um, who had an ER positive breast cancer could forego chemotherapy or not. And it's always had this intermediate risk zone where we don't know the benefit of chemo or not. So what this study did is it randomized patients with a score of um, 11 to 25. 25 was kind of the midpoint in the assay to chemo or no chemo. Every patient over 25 got chemotherapy. And um, what they found was that, um, that there was really no benefit for back. There was no benefit for chemotherapy in patients with a score of 11 to 25. So I think we've answered the question of what to do with the low intermediate group is they don't really need chemotherapy. The only group of patients that did benefit somewhat were patients who were premenopausal. So under the age of 50 with a score between 18 and 25, they did benefit from chemotherapy. But why did they benefit? I think that is, is the question. Um, so going back, I want, I, I want to look back at an older study, the study, the text and the soft studies. So as you know, that we know from the text and the soft study that putting young women who have, who, whose menses have come back or whose estrogen level has risen after adjuvant chemotherapy, putting them into menopause and giving them hormonal therapy does increase their disease-free survival versus just using tamoxifen alone. And this was the result we knew from the text in the soft trials. So if you look at the benefit on, of putting somebody in uh, menopause on the text in the soft trial, you can see there's a several percent benefit. 5% uh, benefit um, of giving ex exemestane plus ovarian suppression versus tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression, and even more by uh, tamoxifen without ovarian suppression. So, the thought is that the benefit we see for Taylor X in patients with a score between 18 and 25 who got chemotherapy may just be due to the fact that we put them in menopause with chemotherapy. Unfortunately, the trial actually didn't check menopausal status. So we're still left with one subgroup of patients under the age of 50 between the ages of 18, between the score of 18 and 25 whether, or 20 and 25, whether they are going to benefit from chemotherapy as their adjuvant therapy. In my mind, if they don't have a higher risk, I think personally that the cancer is the cancer, and if there's a difference in how patients respond, it is because of the, the body that the cancer lives in. And, um, and so why would the same cancer with the same genomic changes act differently in a woman over 50 versus a woman younger than 50. It's because that woman younger than 50 is making hormones. Um, so in my practice, I, I will offer chemotherapy, but I will also tell patients that it's my belief that, that ovarian suppression may achieve the same result in those patients with that intermediate subgroup of, of oncotype. So ASCO, current ASCO guidelines for adjuvant ovarian suppression are women with stage 2 or 3 breast cancers who would uh, be advised to receive chemotherapy. Um, they should also get ovarian suppression in addition to endocrine therapy. And, you know, we, we can do this either by removing their ovaries or a more palatable option for some patients is to go on something like um, a GNRH analog. Um, which they get either every month or every three months along with their endocrine therapy. Um, 
some, the very youngest women, we may have trouble keeping them in menopause that way, and then sometimes we'll have to re recommend taking out their ovaries. Of course, this does increase side effects for these patients. Um, patients who don't warrant chemotherapy with stage one breast cancer should probably not receive ovarian functional suppression um, unless they're in that group of 20 to 25 on Oncotype where you want to improve their prognosis. They don't really need chemo, but you know that ovarian functional suppression may improve their prognosis. Um, and again, we really have to watch. So when these patients come back, you've got a 35-year-old, a 40-year-old who didn't receive, who may have received chemo, but their periods came back and you're giving them a GNRH analog. I like checking their estradiol levels. I've found, unfortunately, many times that patients' estradiol levels go up on a GNRH analog because we just can't suppress these young, young women. All right. Um, I'm going to go through this a sec. Um, OK, one of the other questions that we have is extended adjuvant therapy. And so I, I just want to briefly review what we know about extended adjuvant therapy. I find one of the hardest um, discussions I have with patients is how long should they take their hormonal therapy. Um, you know, the, the initial recommendations have always been five years of tamoxifen, five years of an aromatase inhibitor. But we know, unfortunately, that breast cancer, only half of our recurrences occur in the first five years. Half of our recurrences recur after age, after uh, five years after diagnosis. Up to 15, 20 years, we're seeing some recurrences. Um, of course, the number of recurrences goes down with time, but still, we see many, many recurrences late. Um, so the question is, do patients benefit from taking longer adjuvant hormonal therapy? We know that 10 years, at this point we know from the Adam and Atlas trials that 10 years of tamoxifen improves prognosis over, 10 year, over five years of tamoxifen. We know that five years of an aromatase inhibitor improves prognosis over five years, uh, five years of an aromatase inhibitor after five years of tamoxifen improves prognosis as well, although a lot of the benefit is actually new breast cancers on the other side, contralateral disease, not necessarily metastatic disease. An open question is still, does 10 years of an aromatase inhibitor, is that better than five years? We don't know that question uh, at this point. Trials have been conflicting. So I think what we need to do is we need to really look at the risk, at uh, patient's risk. If they have multiple nodes positive, they may benefit from continuing. There's also some genomic assays that we can use that will tell us whether um, somebody's at higher risk for a late recurrence. So sometimes at five years, I will send off another genomic assay of somebody's original tumor from five years before to see if they're at higher risk for late recurrence and may benefit from additional therapy. But as you can see here, there's only small amounts of benefit for continuing um, for continuing uh, 10 years of an aromatase inhibitor or 10 years of hormonal therapy. Um, now, we did get um, one very positive trial at San Antonio this year. This was a Japanese trial called the ARIS trial, which did um, randomize patients after five years of an aromatase inhibitor to receive five more years of an aromatase inhibitor. Um, and this was actually a positive trial. So um, what they found was that um, a marked improvement, 90, 84% versus 92%. Uh, so 92% of patients were disease-free who continued 10 years of an aromatase inhibitor versus stopping at five years. Um, and this, but this is distant disease-free survival. So this is disease-free survival. It also includes contralateral breast cancers, new breast cancers. This is metastatic de disease. And there was a 3% benefit, and it was statistically significant. Um, so I think it, it behooves a conversation with patients. There are many of my patients who won't want to stop. And there's many who are dying to get off their pills. Um, and I think we need to discuss with them these results. Somebody with positive nodes, this 3% benefit may be larger. Somebody with negative nodes, it may be smaller. Um, there were a, a good majority, 40% uh, of the patients on this trial had positive nodes. So there is a benefit. 
It's a small benefit, and we need to discuss it with our patients. Um, this is the ARIS trial by nodal status, um, um, or this is all trials by nodal status, and if you look, one to three positive nodes does see about a 4% benefit in continuing hormonal therapy. Four or more nodes, there's a 7% benefit, but there's only about a 1% benefit in node negative disease. So we really have to look at the stage that our patients presented with. Um, again, when we give them longer treatment, we have more bone loss, more arthralgias, more fatigue, more menopausal symptoms, more cardiovascular disease. So I think we have to be very judicious in our treatment. You know, we're trying to get the best treatment for our patients with the least amount of side effects, and if we can minimize therapy, that's what we would like to do. All right, let's move on from ER positive disease to triple negative disease. So as you know, triple negative disease, estrogen negative, progesterone receptor negative, HER2 negative. Why do we call it triple negative? Because we don't know what it's positive for at this point. We don't have a hook to treat it with. Like we do HER2 positive disease, we can give an anti-HER2 antibody. Um, estrogen positive disease, we can treat with anti-estrogens. At this point, we don't have an approved therapy for uh, triple negative disease that tells us that it is positive for something that we can uh, treat for. Um, so what we're going to look at is a trial looking at immune therapy. So we know that many triple negative tumors are infiltrated with lymphocytes and they may respond to immune therapy. Unlike in other malignancies that I'm sure you're used to treating where immune therapy is great and it works for melanoma and it works for lung cancer and it works for kidney cancer, we haven't really found a great role until now in it for breast cancer. So this was a German trial in triple negative early stage breast cancer looking at dervalumab um, and these patients got dervalumab and abraxane, uh, a, a nab paclitaxel before uh, surgery. Um, and what they found was there was an increase in um, a pathologic complete response in the patients who got dervalumab. Um, there are a lot of trials ongoing right now looking to see um, if immune therapy will cure more women with early stage breast cancer. So there's neoadjuvant trials going on to see if you get an increased pathologic complete response. There's currently a large intergroup trial going on, which looks at women with triple negative breast cancer who got chemotherapy, but did not have a pathologic complete response, kind of like the Catherine trial we talked about earlier with HER2 positive disease. They're looking at giving an immune therapy after their chemotherapy after their surgery if they didn't have a pathologic complete response and seeing if it cures more women. So I think there's more to come um, on immune therapy and breast cancer. Um, platinum agents. I will routinely use a platinum agent with neoadjuvant chemotherapy in somebody with a very high risk triple negative breast cancer positive nodes, but we don't have great data for that. Um, we have trials that range all the way from a 42% uh, benefit um, to a 30% benefit in pathologic complete response, but we don't know that that translates yet into better survival for these patients. So we're waiting trials that should be coming out soon. There's still trials ongoing to see if there's a benefit for platinums. So at this point, it's, um, you know, every physician has their own uh, way of using platinums in triple negative breast cancer. Um, going to move on. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on to a couple things. Um, and when we talk a lot about pathologic complete response, this is what um, I want you to understand. So the blue line here is the prognosis of women who have had pathologic complete response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Not just HER2 positive, not just estrogen negative, but and the yellow line is women who did not have pathologic complete response. What that means is they've had their chemotherapy before surgery. You do your surgery, there's still tumor in the breast. Look at the big difference. So most of our trials now are really going to be looking in a neoadjuvant setting, 
meaning giving chemotherapy before surgery, looking for a pathologic complete response rate, because we know that it translates into overall survival uh, advantage in patients who have an increased pathologic complete response rate. And the FDA is starting to approve drugs based on pathologic complete response rate. That's how uh, pertuzumab was approved initially in, um, in, for neoadjuvant therapy of breast cancer. You know, when you do a clinical trial looking at adjuvant therapy, in, in a, you have to wait five, 10 years to see how many women have relapsed to get results. For this, you have to wait six months to know after they finish their chemotherapy how they did. So this is, this is the way moving forward in terms of getting drugs approved and finding out what drugs work best in breast cancer. Some of these trials aren't even following patients to see how they relapse, although I think we need to do that to, to make sure that, that what we find out from neoadjuvant chemotherapy really translates into better prognosis for our patients. Um, all right. So, in conclusion, before I move to metastatic disease and localized disease, we want to tailor therapy using the neoadjuvant model, uh, like we did, um, and uh, replace traditional systemic therapy with targeted treatments if we can. Um, we want to de escalate our neoadjuvant chemotherapy if we can. Um, and we want to escalate our adjuvant therapy in patients who have not had a complete response to their neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Okay, the one other thing I want to talk to you about, and this is why we, we need our navigators. Um, we know that delaying care matters to patients. So in a patient who presents with a breast cancer, if you um, delay surgery, so if the time to surgery in the blue line is less than 30 days, you have this prognosis. But if you look here at these last two, waiting greater than three months for surgery, those patients have a worse prognosis. So we really need to get these patients in and through. And I, I know you probably all have the same frustrations I do with insurance companies that take long times to approve things and it delays our patients. I think we really need to advocate for our patients and get them in uh, much more quickly. In, in triple negative breast cancer patients, if we delay more than 90 days from surgery to chemotherapy, look at how worse their prognosis is, okay? It's a problem. It's a problem when women get reconstructions and they may have wound healing issues and they're delayed and they're delayed and they're delayed. I think, you know, we need to educate our surgeons um, about this. We need to start chemo regardless if we can. If there's a wound healing issue and it doesn't look like we're going to save an implant, then we need to get rid of that implant if it's a high risk patient so that they can get their chemotherapy. It's also another reason to consider chemotherapy before surgery, because they've got it in when they're healthy, when they don't have wounds that heal, need to heal, and plus then we can determine whether they're responding to the chemotherapy and whether there's something we can do after surgery to improve their prognosis. Um, one more thing I want to mention, this was a really nice trial at San Antonio this year um, about hot flashes. So, um, you know, I do breast cancer all day long. I hear a lot about hot flashes all day long. And of course, in a breast cancer patient, we really don't want to give them estrogen. We know that estrogen is associated with an, increased, um, an increase in, in death from breast cancer. So what do we do? In the past, we've given them things like, um, like antidepressants, um, venlafaxine, citalopram, and those work pretty well, and they help the moodiness of menopause too. Um, but, you know, they still have hot flashes, so we have room to maneuver to, to improve things. So, so this trial was done using oxybutynin. Do you guys know what oxybutynin is? So oxybutynin is, is a drug for uh, bladder spasms and, and incontinence. And so it gave very, oops, I hit the wrong button. It gave very low doses, 2.5 milligrams BID or 5 milligrams BID of oxybutynin to these patients with hot flashes. And what it showed was a marked 
decrease in hot flashes with these drugs. Now, a lot of patients don't want to take venlafaxine or citalopram because it's an antidepressant, and they don't want an antidepressant. I don't need an antidepressant. I don't believe in antidepressants. Don't give me an antidepressant. This is a non-antidepressant way to improve hot flashes. And if you actually compare it to previous trials, this is with placebo, the number of hot flashes per day. Now, this is cross-trial comparison. These weren't compared head to head, but just look at the difference. So this is what um, venlafaxine does. It decreases hot flashes by 40%. Oxybutynin decreases them by 60% in that trial. Small trial, but it is another agent that we can use for these women. Um, and I've started using it. I haven't gotten much feedback yet, but I think it's great to have another option, and I think it's something uh, we can suggest to our patients. I know, you know, a lot of times the patients don't talk to the doctors about this all the time. I mean, I, I ask about menopausal symptoms, but, you know, maybe in a busy, vi busy visit, um, people don't really have time to talk to their doctors about it. So they'll talk to the nurses, or they'll talk to the navigators, or they'll talk to the uh, PAs and NPs. So if you hear this, this is something that you can suggest for these patients. All right. So that's curable breast cancer. I'm going to move on to metastatic breast cancer. Um, I guess we'll just do questions at the end. Um, so we're going to talk about metastatic breast cancer. And um, metastatic breast cancer has had modest improvements in, in the last 50 years. Um, it's, it's a very difficult um, uh, thing to treat. We have great drugs for it. We can often extend survival. But in our, our worst breast cancers, the triple negative breast cancers, we, we really haven't made great progress um, in terms of uh, time patients are alive with metastatic breast cancer. So what are our goals of therapy? Um, our goals of therapy are rarely cure. Rarely cure. I will tell you that in patients, some select patients with HER2 positive breast cancer, I've seen patients not relapse. I have patients out as many as 14 years now who have never relapsed from their first line of HER2 positive therapy for metastatic breast cancer. But they're the exception, not the rule. Um, so, so more realistically, our goals are to prolong progression-free survival and overall survival to make their quality of life good and control their symptoms with the least amount of toxicity. Um, so what we're going to talk about is what treatment options are available for different subtypes of metastatic breast cancer and what's new in that. Um, again, a review of breast cancer subtypes. ER positive accounts for 65 to 70 percent of disease. HER2 positive, 15 to 20 percent. And triple negative, the remainder. Um, so this is a clinical pathway for estrogen receptor, a former clinical pathway for estrogen receptor positive um, uh, cancers. We used to, for adjuvant therapy, they'd either get tamoxifen and AI. Um, and then for first-line metastatic disease, they would get um, a non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor like anastrozole or letrozole. Um, then they would go on to fulvestrant and third-line therapy. Um, exemestane and everolimus, perhaps, for, for um, ER-positive breast cancer. Um, so that, that's generally the clinical pathway that we had followed in the past uh, before recent approvals for estrogen receptor-positive breast cancer. And then came the CDK4-6 inhibitors. So the CDK4-6 inhibitor, like palbociclib, ribociclib, and abemaciclib, they have, sh they have markedly improved the prognosis. So when given as first or second line with hormonal therapy, they've doubled the progression-free survival of, of patients. Um, so let's look at that, for instance, in the Mona Lisa trial, the Mona Lisa three trial, which looked at patients with estrogen receptor positive, advanced breast cancer, who had um, uh, one or fewer lines of therapy for metastatic disease. They were given fulvestrin plus placebo or uh, fulvestrin plus ribociclib. And what you see here is the progression-free survival, so the amount of time they lived before the cancer progressed. You can see in the blue line the women who got both drugs had a marked improvement in their progression-free survival. Um, and again, in the Paloma three study, which looked at palbociclib plus fulvestrin, again, you saw a marked improvement in progression-free survival. Um, so um, 
in this group of patients, um, they had hormone receptor positive, um, HER2 negative advanced breast cancer. They were randomized one to one. This is the Mona, Le uh, Mona Lisa trial to ribociclib versus placebo. Again, doubling of the progression free survival with uh, endocrine therapy alone, a 13 month progression free survival, um, 24 months when you add the, um, the, um, endo the CDK4 6 inhibitor with it. So if you look about all of these patients benefit, about double their progression-free survival, and all clinical subsets can benefit from this, um, progesterone-negative disease, lobular disease, bone-only disease, de novo metastatic disease, uh, patients with a longer disease-free interval, and it's consistent across the subtypes. What we don't know is whether it um, improves overall survival. But a trial was presented this year at, um, at, at San Antonio, which did show a non-statistically significant but a numerical benefit in overall survival. So it does appear that we are benefiting our patients in terms of living longer if we add one of these CDK4-6 inhibitors to their first or second line metastatic hormonal treatments. Okay, now what else is new um, in estrogen receptor positive disease? So there are um, uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors that are being developed right now. Uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors um, um, inhibit the PI3 kinase, which is a growth factor, uh, an internal growth factor in these breast cancer cells. Now some, some cells, when we send them off for genomic testing, we'll find that they, they have a PI3 kinase mutation. Um, so there are particular breast cancers we want to see if patients who have a PI3 kinase mutation in their breast cancer may benefit more from these drugs. So there was a trial called the Sandpiper trial which looked at um, um, uh, tocilizumab um, with fulvestrant versus fulvestrant alone. And what you find is when it was added there was about a two-month progression-free survival benefit. Not what we saw with the CDK4-6 inhibitors where you're seeing a 12, 14-month progression-free survival. But trying to get a more specific trial in the right patient. So that's what oncology is about now, trying to find the targeted drug and find the right patient for their targeted drug. So when you pick out patients that have a PIK, PIK3 uh, kinase mutation when you send it off for something like foundation or garden testing, um, and then, then you give them um, a, a PI3 kinase inhibitor versus not, versus the non-mutant cohort, what are we going to find? What we're going to find is that in the PI3K mutant cohort, we have a marked improvement in progression-free survival. So six months to 11 months five-month progression-free survival benefit, almost a doubling of the progression-free survival in this population versus that two-month when we saw with unselected patients. And there was not a significant benefit in the patients who did not have uh, the mutation. Um, again, all drugs are associated with some side effects. This one, rash and hyperglycemia were the biggest side effect and some diarrhea. So the addition of a PI3 kinase drug to fulvestrant significantly prolonged progression-free survival in that selected population. So, you know, in many malignancies, we've been sending off a lot of genomic tests, um, to, um, different uh, genomic tests to see if they have mutations, and we find mutations, and we can treat them. It hasn't been, a, um, it hasn't been that helpful in breast cancer. But when we get the approval of these drugs, like a PI3 kinase inhibitor, then we're going to know that we need to send off these tumors to see if the patient's tumor does have a PI3 kinase mutation. So we're getting into a more molecular area for breast cancer now. So now what's the clinical pathway for estrogen receptor positive disease? So endocrine therapy plus a CDK inhibitor or endocrine alone. And if they have endocrine alone, then we want to add a CDK inhibitor for the second line therapy. Or we could add a PI3 kinase inhibitor when they get approved if they have a PI3 kinase in, um, mutation. Or we could do endocrine therapy plus an mTOR inhibitor. So in patients, mTOR inhibitors may benefit patients um, who have a PI3 kinase um, mutation right now. So I'll tend to give an mTOR inhibitor second line in those patients, and you can combine it with either fulvestrant or an aromatase inhibitor like eximestane. 
Um, for indolent disease, we may want to just do the endocrine therapy initially alone. And once they progress through that, then we have to think about chemotherapy. Or we can think about a bemaciclib, another CDK4-6 inhibitor, if they haven't been exposed to that in the past, um, which works as a single agent. So in patients maybe who have been on long lines of hormonal therapy and then chemo, but they've never seen a CDK4-6 inhibitor, we can add this to their regimen. And then if they have a PARP inhibitor, we can give them, I'm, I'm sorry, if they have a BRCA mutation, we can consider a PARP inhibitor. All right, um, so let's move on to HER2-positive disease. Um, as you know, we've had multiple, multiple drug approvals for HER2-positive disease. Um, it is clearly the, one of the easier subtypes we have to treat now that we have so many targeted agents for it. Um, but we're still looking for more. Um, we currently have neratinib in clinical trials for um, for metastatic disease. It has particular affinity for brain metastases, which is great. We have tucatinib, which the trials are just concluding on, and maybe we'll see an approval in the next year of tucatinib, which is also an, um, an oral um, HER2, uh, anti-HER2 agent. It does penetrate the brain as well. Um, these drugs are a little farther from approval. Um, margituximab is a new antibody, and the trials just announced that it was positive. Um, meaning that the trial compared this to trastuzumab in patients who had later line um, HER2 positive disease who had already been exposed to um, Herceptin, uh, pertuzumab, um, and TDM1. They randomized them to get chemo with margituximab or chemo with uh, trastuzumab, and margituximab was better. We still haven't seen that data, but the company did announce that it's a positive trial. So we may have a new uh, antibody option in the near future for our patients. So again, this is the tucatinib, which um, does show um, improved um, prognosis in patients versus um, uh, with brain metastases with capecitabine and trastuzumab. Um, and then this new drug is really exciting, trastuzumab deruxtecan. So trastuzumab deruxtecan is, um, is like TDM1. It's an antibody drug conjugate, meaning that we've got a, a trastuzumab arm and a chemo is attached to it, and the trastuzumab gets that chemo into the cell. But this appears to um, work on cells around it. It also seems to work for patients who have HER2 1 plus and 2 plus disease. So studies are ongoing with this drug, and we hope to see it come to the clinic um, in the next few years. Just looking at this, so in HER2 positive cohort, this is a, a, um, a, a waterfall plot. And what you can see here is only this small subgroup of patients, you know, up to 10% didn't respond to this. 90% of patients had some sort of shrinkage of their tumor to the trastuzumab deruxtecan. Um, and in this HER2 low group, this is the HER2 1 or 2 plus. So these are patients that we don't consider HER2 positive. Look at 90% had some sort of improvement in prognosis. It appears to not require that much HER2 on the, on the cell surface to actually work. So, uh, you know, again, I think we're getting more exciting. A lot of our triple negative patients have one or two plus HER2. Maybe they could benefit from this in the future. Um, but, of course, what we're all interested in is, is immune therapy. Um, like every other uh, tumor type, you know, uh, as a breast cancer doctor, I feel left out of the immune therapy party. Um, so, so what we want is we want to try to find a way to use immune therapy. And... Um, so this, this trial looked at venerelbine plus trastuzumab uh, plus avelumab, um, and it's, it's still ongoing. Um, so we're trying to find a role for it. Um, I'm going to skip through these quickly because we're getting low on time here, and I want to move on to triple negative disease because we've ha really had very little for triple negative disease up till now, but we've, we've actually gotten quite a few new things and are expecting a bunch of new ones this year. So I want to quickly discuss that before we, um, before we end. So again, immune checkpoint inhibition, um, uh, 
PD anti PDL1 agents. We've been left out of the party, but now we have this. So the Impassion um, uh, 130 study that we participated in randomized patients with first line metastatic breast cancer, so they'd never been treated, first line metastatic triple negative, they'd never been treated with any chemotherapy. It randomized them to NAB paclitaxel, because you don't need to use steroids with it, which would be an immune suppressant, plus, um, plus PDL1, um, atezolizumab or placebo. And what these patients and what we found was an improvement in progression free survival in patients whose tumors were PDL1 positive. And they just had to be any PDL1 positive greater than 1%. So this drug was actually approved by the FDA last month. We have our first drug approval ever for triple negative breast cancer which is, is really exciting for our patients. So what you need to do if you have a, new, a patient with new triple negative breast cancer is you need to get that tumor tested for PDL1. If that PDL1 is 1% or greater, these patients can have a significant improvement in their prognosis if they get atezolizumab with NAB paclitaxel as their first line chemotherapy. So that's really, really, really important to know for our patients. Now they do not benefit if they're PDL1 negative, so we don't need to waste the time, the money, the toxicity on, on those patients. We know who has a chance of benefiting. Um, and if you look at overall survival, this even had an overall survival benefit, which is, which is really hard to come by in, in metastatic breast cancer uh, trials. Um, now, another drug um, which I'm, I'm personally very excited about is sasituzumab. Uh, sasituzumab, again, is an uh, antibody um, drug conjugate, again, one of these Trojan horse antibodies which gets the chemo right into the drug cell. Um, this is um, an antibody against trope 1, which is found on many, many different kinds of cancers and many different types of breast cancers, but this trial looked at it in triple negative breast cancer. And um, they had a very, very positive trial. So if you look here again at the waterfall plot, um, only about 20% you know, didn't have any benefit from it. Most of these triple negative patients had a benefit from this drug, and these were patients with later line disease. This isn't first line metastatic breast cancer. This is patients who have been through two or three um, chemotherapy regimens already. Now, this, this drug actually came to the FDA last month, and the FDA rejected it, but not based on efficacy. They, they would have accepted it based on efficacy. They rejected it apparently because of some manufacturing issues. So the company is working on those manufacturing issues and hopefully they'll get them right and hopefully the FDA will approve it because I think we desperately, desperately need new drugs for our triple negative patients. Um, one other thing I want to show you about this drug is, uh, this is called a swimmer's plot. This shows how long they responded. And what you can see is that some patients responded for almost, for more than three years to this drug. I mean, when have we seen anybody with triple negative breast cancer respond for three years to a chemotherapy? I haven't. Okay, so we still don't know how to best use immune therapy in triple negative breast cancer patients. Hopefully we will find out, hopefully we'll find out if it helps CNS disease in these patients. And hopefully by combining agents, maybe we can make these cold tumors that are PDL1 negative respond to immune therapy. So again, we have new therapies for, um, for these triple negative patients. Um, and one thing I do want to talk about is PARP inhibitors for BRCA mutation patients. Um, so we know that you know, a certain subgroup of patients with triple negative disease have uh, genetic mutations um, in BRCA1, BRCA2, or in something called RAD51. Um, these these um, mutations um, interrupt um, DNA repair with what's called homologous recombination. Um, so PARP inhibitors um, were meant to um, interrupt the other pathway for DNA repair. So if you don't have homologous recombination and you give a drug that takes away the other ability to repair DNA, we're hoping that we can kill cells because then they can't repair their, normal D their abnormal DNA. 
So PARP inhibitors were designed for that. And PARP inhibitors have been approved in ovarian cancer for a long time, and they tend to work better in patients with ovarian cancer who have BRCA mutations because they have homologous recombination um, um, deficiencies. Um, so what we do know, we have gotten two approvals this year, um, in the past year, for PARP inhibitors for metastatic breast cancer. We've gotten um, um, olaparib through the Olympiad trial, and telozaparib was just approved in, I think, November last year for um, uh, metastatic breast cancer. What does this mean? This means, again, we need more genomic and genetic testing for these patients. We can't know who's going to qualify for this unless we test them. So the new recommendation is actually to test all metastatic breast cancer patients for genetic mutations. So you know, when we send a genetic uh, testing on our new breast cancer patients, we use certain criteria. Do they have a family history? You know, do they have triple negative disease under the age of 60? Are they under the age of 50? And those are the patients that we generally send a genetic test on. Now, because we have a drug, we have two drugs meant for patients with BRCA or perhaps RAD51 mutations, we need to test all of our metastatic breast cancer patients. So we can do genetic testing. You can also do it the other way around through genomic testing because, of course, a genetic <laughs> test will show a mutation that's in every cell in the body, so it's going to be in the tumor. So you should find it in the tumor, too, if you do genomic testing. So again, we have multiple reasons now to test breast cancer patients. For, for different things, for PDL1, for, um, for BRCA mutations. Um, and again, this, this is an impressive trial. So, what it showed was they randomized patients to telezoparib in the BRCA trial versus drug uh, of the investigator's choice. So, the patients in the green line got chemotherapy of the investigator's choice, the others got telezoparib. And what you see here is all subgroups benefited. Um, in, in terms of telezoparib was better for these patients with BRCA mutations and metastatic disease than chemotherapy was. All right, so I think I'm going to end there in, um, uh, for time reasons. Um, not much left except for, again, if we send off genomic testing, we can get our patients on trials like the MATCH trial, the TAPER trial, which look for um, um, new agents that might be benefit our patients. Um, and with that said, do we have any questions? Thank you. Yes? It's either 2.5 milligrams BID seem to work as well as 5 milligrams BID. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.
lot going on and there's a lot new and um, yeah, hopefully everyone is keeping up with this a little bit. It's really hard. It's hard for me and I, that's is all I do all day and it's hard for me to keep up with what's going on in B cell malignancies. So we're going to talk about um, novel agents. We're going to talk about new indications. We're going to talk about um, uh, management strategies, how you sequence these drugs. Um, there's really a whole lot happening here. So just to put this in context, this is sort of a pie chart of the um, most common mature B cell malignancies. I'm going to be focusing mainly on CLL, SLL, follicular, diffuse large cell, but we'll be hitting mantle cell and marginal zone too. So hitting a big piece of this pie, essentially ignoring T cell and plasma cell disorders. So we are still using chemotherapy in these, drug, in these um, diseases, increasing our use of novel agents, um, and then combinations of novel agents are definitely um, one of the biggest areas of study at this time. So if you feel like you're having a hard time keeping up with B cell malignancies, this is a, just a very simplified, and hopefully you guys ha have these slides because I've tried to give you resources here too. Um, just some timelines, so not only the initial approval of drugs, but then they come in one disease and then they get approved in other diseases, and there's really a whole lot happening here, as you can see. Um, this is really why so much is happening, because we've figured out targets and drugs that will hit these targets. Um, you can see here the abrutinib, acalabrutinib, our BT, BTK inhibitors, your, our idelalisib, duvalisib, copanlisib, our PI3 kinase inhibitors, and Dr. Krill Jackson talked about PI3 kinase activity in breast cancer as well. And then we've got down here um, venetoclax, which is our BCL2 inhibitor. Um, so you can see that these agents hit different parts of this, these pathways, signaling pathways. And so combining them is going to be um, a, a big focus of future research. So these are our, I'm really trying to focus here on novel agents because everyone knows CHOP, everyone knows those regimens. Th this is really what's new. So our BT BTK inhibitors, we've got a brutinib and a calibrutinib, our PI3 kinase, we started with idelalisib, and now we have copanlisib and duvalisib. We've got venetoclax as our BCL2 and then our immune modulator, lenalidomide, which is being used in a host of um, B cell malignancies now. So let's start with BTK inhibitors. So abrutinib, it's been around, right, 2013. It got approved for mantle cell, but it's also now approved for CLL, SLL, both treatment naive and, and relapse refractory. Waldenstrom's for, again, first line or second and beyond, um, previously treated marginal zone lymphomas and uh, chronic graft versus host disease. Do you do aloes here? Aloe transplants? No, but you send people for aloes, right? And they come back to you with their chronic graft versus host disease. So that this is, um, abrutinib is used in chronic graft versus host disease as well. So in just trying to give you updates on the data, so this is a, sing, a study of single agent abrutinib in patients over 65, and we've got five-year survival um, follow-up now. So at five years, progression-free survival is 92% in, in initial therapy patients. So these are folks who have been on abrutinib for five years, and 92% of them are still taking their abrutinib, doing great. And then in the relapsed refractory population, it's 44%. And then the median progression-free survival still hasn't been met at five years in the treatment-naive population. This sort of reminds me of when imatinib or Gleevec came to CLL, and we sort of had this huge shift of um, survival curves for these patients. And so, you know, at seven years, there are still patients on. So this is really great. This is why you have so many people on these drugs. So in looking at untreated elderly patients, at four years, there is a significant progression and death risk reduction for these patients. And this was a study that looked at abrutinib versus chlorambucil. Um, but again, 
the older patients doing great. You've got lots of them in here in uh, South Florida, your older folks. Um, and then the discontinuation rate due to adverse events is also quite uh, attractive in these patients too. 65% um, of them have continued on. So then let's look at this pitting these drugs against chemotherapy, right? Because when we got bendamustine for CLL, that was a great, that was a wonderful thing, right? We didn't have to use fludarabine all the time anymore. We got bendamustine. So this study looked at older patients and they got a brutinib rituxan or bendamustine rituxan. And these were um, older folks newly diagnosed. So as you can see here, and it, well, there were three arms to this, I'm sorry. Single agent abrutinib, abrutinib, abrutinib plus rituxan, or BR. And as you can see here, this is um, progression-free survival here. And the abrutinib folks definitely um, have a better progression-free survival. But I, there are two little lines there. There really was no difference between those who got rituximab with the abrutinib versus those who didn't. So um, not giving lots of rituximab with your abrutinib for CLL patients, this is the data that um, supports that. But definitely better than BR. And you know, essentially a lot different toxicity. I don't want to say less, but different toxicity. And we're, we're going to get into that too. So this might be the most exciting abrutinib data that has come. And this came um, at ASH this year. So this study looked at abrutinib and rituximab versus FCR in young patients with CLL, newly diagnosed. So you know we've sort of saved FCR for this population, our young folks, giving them our most aggressive therapy. You know FCR, lots of um, cytopenias, lots of side effects, lots of issues. And if you look at this, so right now with the data we have, the red line is, um, the abrutinib and rituximab arm, it appears that it is uh, more efficacious. Um, and this is really a potentially practice changing um, set of data that is coming out now. So we're all excited to keep getting more follow-up data, but this is really going to change how we're treating our younger patients, which is really wonderful. So in mantle cell, so this was the study that got it approved. Um, single agent rituximab in relapsed refractory mantle cell, overall response rate 67%, um, and then the median overall survival is about 22 months. But then this segues into the activity of venetoclax in mantle cell um, and adding those two things together. And this continues under study, but when you add venetoclax to it, you get over about 70% um, overall response rate. So really trying to improve upon these great drugs and getting more bang for our buck out of them. So marginal zone lymphoma. This is really a redheaded stepchild, right? You don't hear anything about marginal zone lymphoma because there is really no established standard treatment for these patients. Um, this is not a um, large volume subtype of lymphoma. But we now have a drug that we can specifically use for this patient population in the relapse refractory setting. And again, you're gonna see here, the dosing is a little different, and I've got a slide um, a little later that shows you, or I, I, actually it was on the first slide, I showed you the dosing um, by the disease type or the indication. Um, but for these folks, almost 50% overall response rate, and the duration of response not reached at 19 months. So again, this is a great option for this set of patients that we really don't have good established uh, standards for. So chronic graft versus host disease, and you, you're not seeing huge numbers of these patients, but just so you know, when you're sent, would you send them to Miami? Where do you send your patients for aloe? Moffitt, Miami, somewhere else, right? Um, so chronic graft versus host disease is a, um, one of the major toxicities of aloe transplant, and um, abrutinib is, changes how T cells interact, specifically IL-2, which is uh, T cells are the driving force behind graft versus host disease. And so for patients who don't respond to steroids, we don't have good options for them. And as you can see here, um, there's a 67% response rate in patients who have failed steroids um, and sustained response for upwards of a half a year, 20 weeks, 
Um, but this, this is how this got approved for chronic graft-versus-host disease. So now, just when you think you have your head wrapped around a brutinib, we now have a calibrutinib, right? Are you guys using these drugs? Who's using these? No one's using these. No one. Really? OK. Yes, who's using them? OK, OK, good. OK, so if you're not using them, go back and ask why you're not using them. But also, I wonder, are your practices using them and you just don't know this is happening because the patient gets the prescription and gets handed the prescription and goes? Do you think that's what's happening? Could be? OK, well, that, that is, that's, let me tell you, that is a very common thing for nurses, oncology nurses, not to be aware of all the patients getting these drugs. But you're the ones taking the calls, right? Patients call. Who answer, who's part of answering phones when patients call? OK, more people, <laughs> right? So when they're on these drugs, you sort of need to know what, these, what they're all about and what the side effects are. But the thing that really is most scary to me is that all of you are the biggest patient advocates. And if you're not aware these people are out there on these drugs, um, I don't think anyone takes better care of patients than oncology nurses. And if you're out of the loop, um, we probably could be doing a whole lot better with these patients than we do. But now we have a calibrutinib which is a second generation BTK inhibitor. It is currently approved in mantle cell. Um, it's on the NCCN guidelines in CLL, SLL. This is a twice daily um, drug. So in mantle cell, remember our overall response rate for abrutinib was about 67% in the relapse refractory setting. Here it's 81% and we're, we're seeing complete responses, which is wonderful. Um, and then we're going to talk about safety a little later. Um, but so this is how this drug got approved. And then in CLL, in the relapse refractory setting, um, overall response rate of 97%. Right? Look at that. These are great drugs. I guarantee your patients are getting these. I hope your patients are getting these. Because um, these are good drugs, and I'm hoping that you're just not aware that your patients are getting them. Um, and then the safety profile is, is, is good with the calibrutinib. So looking at treatment naive, CLL, this was a small study. Um, and again, these were treatment naive patients. Overall response rate, 90%. OK, so these are really great drugs. Um, we're going to talk about AFib and AFlutter later, but low incidences of this. So this is really appears to be safe and efficacious in CLL as well as mantle cell. So let's look at this. I know you have patients getting these drugs, right? So <laughs> I, I know you do. There's no way you don't have patients getting these drugs. So when you're getting calls, right? And so these are just nice little things that you can go back to to uh, help when you get these calls or you know, helping guide patients through this, because these folks are not in your chairs, but they're out there. So one of the classic things with BTK inhibitors is this transient lymphocytosis. So what happens is the nodes actually shrink, and the lymphocytes from the lymph nodes push out into the peripheral blood. So you know you have these patients with CLL who bring their 15-year graph in of their lymphocyte count. Do you have those people? those retired engineers, those you know, numbers folks, they are going to completely, they're going to have a psych admission if they're not ready for this, right? Because their lymph nodes will shrink, the lymphocytes will go out into the peripheral blood, and their lymphocyte count will skyrocket. So this happens in about 77% of patients who get a brutinib and about 50% of patients who get a calibrutinib. This is not progression. It's not associated with a poor prognosis or a good prognosis. It just is. It's how these drugs work. So it's important that patients, who's, who's a navigator? Do we have navigators here? Do, are you familiar with these drugs? Oh, yes, no, yes? OK, good. OK, thank you. Thank you. So all right, so we have our navigator hopefully letting patients know that this, this is uh, likely to happen. So there's GI toxicity with. Um, these drugs, and it's nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, so all these numbers, 31 is nausea, 23 is vomiting, and the 59 is diarrhea. So as you can see, there is a high incidence of diarrhea with these 
drugs, but very few patients have severe diarrhea. And so it improves over time. And when I say over time, I mean over two or three years, um, it improves. Um, and what I have patients do when they have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea is I have them take it at night and take you know, an antiemetic with it at night. And then if they're still having diarrhea, I have them get up in the morning and take um, Imodium or some over-the-counter anti-diarrheal. So for those of you answering the phone, this is important for you to know. Um, headaches are a, a new twist, uh, mainly with a calibrutinib. About 40% of patients will have headaches, but not severe headaches. Um, that's just another, another unique thing. Some of the classic things that happen with these patients is AFib, and it's low, right? Five, or somewhere around five, three to five percent less for a calibrutinib, but it happens with both of them. So this is something everybody needs to be aware of. This is one of the, um, you know, the, the showstoppers, I say, for these drugs. Um, fortunately, if someone develops AFib on a brutinib, you can switch them to a calibrutinib right, because it has a little less um, AFib. Um, lots of drug interactions with these drugs, too, and I'll talk about this in a bit, but bleeding and hemorrhage, this is another important thing. So as you can see here, about 44 to 50 percent of patients will have minor <laughs> bleeding. It's really typical for them to have bleeding when they brush or floss, when they blow their nose. Some of them can develop petechiae, but very few, somewhere around 3 percent, actually have significant bleeding. The really important thing is this one. So if you have patients on these drugs when they have minor procedures, so dental, a dental cleaning is a minor procedure. They need to hold for three days before and after. If they have major procedures, they need to hold for a week before and after. Okay, so this is really important for your patients to be aware of because they can have bleeding um, if they don't hold these drugs. Um, infections, that's always an issue with this patient population. Um, for your folks who have been treated over and over and over again, they're probably on prophylactic anti-infectives anyway. Um, there's a risk of second malignancies. Skin cancers really are the most common ones, and I feel sorry for you guys down here in Florida with all this sunshine. So people <laughs> need to wear their, their sunscreen um, and be careful when they're in the sun. Um, and then hypertension is an issue with a brutinib not reported in a calibrutinib. So um, hopefully this is helpful for you to have these little grids. This is the dosing based on the disease or the situation um, for both of these drugs, uh, a brutinib and a calibrutinib. And this is just a roll up of, of what I just talked about. But you can see on the bottom, lots and lots and lots of drug drug interactions. I don't know how you keep track of this in your practice, but this is a real challenge. Um, I'm always looking and looking out, and there are so many new drugs in general um, that I don't even recognize, you know, antihypertensives and things like that, um, because their world is changing as fast as ours is, and I'm continuously looking these drugs up, trying to figure out drug-drug interactions, and then just follow the package insert from there. So PI3 kinase inhibitors, and this is what Dr. Krill Jackson was talking about in breast cancer. Um, Idelalisib, has anybody used Idelalisib? Okay, this was the first in class drug for PI3 kinase inhibitors. Um, and so now we have Duvalisib and Copanlisib. So Idelalisib is an oral twice a day. Duvalisib is also an oral twice a day. And we recently got copanlisib, which is an IV drug. So for those of you who work in infusion areas, you may be seeing this soon. It's weekly for three weeks and then off for one week. And again, approved in different um, diseases. So idelalisib has the most robust, so relapse CLL, relapse follicular, relapse SLL. Um, Duvalisib is relapsed or refractory CLL, relapsed or refractory follicular, and then copanlisib is just for follicular at this point, and then also we can use it for marginal zone. So Duvalisib was recently approved um, based on this data. It was the DUO trial. And so this, you can, this is kind of um, foggy here, but the first, the first set of um, 
data here is overall response rate and then it's nodal response. So as you can see, um, the overall response rate is somewhere about 74% in these patients, which is wonderful and lots of nodal response. Um, and then let me just say, here's another study that really, that looked at mainly follicular lymphoma patients and this population had a 42% overall response rate. But then in terms of sequencing, you can see here that patients who had received bendamustine previously responded less favorably to duvalisib. So as we get more of these drugs, the sequencing is going to have to be fleshed out of what do you use first, what do you use second, what do you use third, and you know, which doors close if you use uh, drugs in, the, in different orders. So copanlisib. And I'm excited to have an IV option because now they get back in your chair and you know they're there, right? <laughs> not, not only you know they're there, you get to interact with them now. And I think we lose out on that when we're giving these oral drugs um, without an infusional uh, need. So copanlisib is approved in relapse refractory or it was studied in relapse refractory um, lymphomas. It has been most of these, oh, sorry, wrong. The dark blue sort of blue, this color, are the folliculars. So you can see this is disease response. So most of these are that dark blue. So follicular lymphoma responds very well to copanlisib. And I've just started using this, um, and hopefully you're going to see it soon. So this, again, is a roll-up of these drugs, the doses, the schedules, the most common adverse events. Um, as you can see, the idelalisib, um, it has a immune related, immune sort of like toxicity with colitis and pneumonitis and things like that. Um, duvalisib and copanlisib, not so much of that. Um, again, lots of drug drug interactions um, with, these, with these agents. So, unique adverse events, so diarrhea, you can see here, is actually highest with copanlisib. Um, and then just follow the package insert on what to do there. Pneumonitis is an issue for all of these drugs. Um, hepatitis, so following um, transaminases and things like that are important for these. And follow the package inserts with holding and dose reducing. The unique one for copanlisib, and this is the one, that, remember the patients are going to be in your chair because this is an IV drug. Uh, they can develop hyperglycemia. And so lots of our older folks have diabetes. Um, as you can see here, it peaks about five to eight hours after the infusion, and then it rapidly goes back to normal. So unless your patients are starting out with really poorly controlled diabetes, you can easily work them through this. They're gonna have a little spike, you know, about eight hours after the drug, and then it goes back to normal. And they're getting it weekly, so this is really not a huge huge deal, but it's something that your diabetics need to be aware of. Um, hypertension is another one. About 25% of our copanlisib patients will develop hypertension. And so, is, as you can see in the last column here, at two hours, it starts to decrease, but it can stay elevated for six to eight hours. So again, just making sure people are under good control, that they know this is going to happen. It's sort of happens quickly and resolves quickly, but it does happen. So your folks who watch their glucoses and their um, blood pressures carefully are gonna need to know about that. So venetoclax is a BCL2 inhibitor. BCL2 is responsible for apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. And when uh, BCL2 is altered, Cells think that they should live forever. They don't have their normal lifespan programmed into them, and venetoclax can fix that. So it is currently approved for CLL, SLL, second line or higher, and it just came for AML, which I'm not talking about, but you know we've got these patients out here too with not good treatment options. Um, so these are the very old folks with yeah, these are your 80-year-olds. We now have an oral option for them, and it's on the NCCN guidelines for mantle cell. So in relapse refractory CLL, this is venetoclax and rituxin versus, um, sorry, yes, versus uh, bendamustine and rituxin. So again, using less chemotherapy 
in our, our B cell malignancies. It takes them out of your chair, but this actually used rituxan, so that gets them back in your chair, right? So as you can see here, the, the top line is the uh, venetoclax and rituxan. Um, and the really exciting part about this is not only was it a better regimen, but they get, they get rituxan monthly for six months, and then they stay on venetoclax for two years and stop it. So to date, these had all been open-ended, that as long as you were responding to them, you stayed on them. So now this study inserts a stopping point for the venetoclax for patients, which is, which is a great thing too. Um, again, progression-free survival, 84% in the venetoclax rituxan, 36% in our BR patients. So I wanted to show you this. This was the, the, some of the early data with venetoclax in CLL that showed an almost 80% response rate, right? The biggest thing with venetoclax is in these early trials, patients, they, there were some patients that died of tumor lysis syndrome. So that is like such a blessing and a curse, isn't it? So we now have drugs that work so well and so quickly in CLL that tumor lysis syndrome is, a, is potentially fatal. So when you give this drug, are you, uh, Miss Navigator, are you giving venetoclax? No? Oh, I want you to give these drugs. But when you do, pull this out, because you're going to know everything you need to know about it. So this, in this, this drug works so well that it now gets ramped up because of those patients. 400 milligrams is full dose. And in the early trials, when, when patients got started at full dose, they had devastating tumor lysis syndrome. So now it's this 20 for the first week, 50, 100, 200, and then 400. So it's not until week five that they get up to full dose, okay? Um, this is what the initial ramp up dosing looks like. And this is whomever uh, created this did a beautiful job. So this is week one. So there's a calendar there. It's all color coded. Patients can't mess this up. Week one, week two, week three, week four, they get this beautiful starter pack. Um, so when you start using this drug, patients, it, they almost have to try to mess this up to mess this up. Um, and again, this is all about tumor lysis syndrome. And so here you, you can, and this comes right from the package insert, low, medium, and high risk. For around the first two doses, the 20 and the 50, everyone needs some tumor lysis monitoring. But these high risk folks, so if they have any lymph node greater than 10 centimeters or a lymphocyte count above 25,000 and big lymph nodes greater than five centimeters, they get admitted for their first two doses. They get admitted and have intensive tumor lysis monitoring around them. But really, once you get over the hump, people tolerate this drug beautifully. A little nausea, a little fatigue, really well-tolerated drug. <coughs> okay, now moving on to our immune modulators, okay? Everybody knows lenalidomide? Does everybody know lenalidomide? Yes, yes yay, finally, okay. so. You know that this class of drugs, lenalidomide, thalidomide, palmolidomide, are really used like water in the myeloma population. And there are new ones coming, <clears throat> but lenalidomide has and is moving more um, quickly into, into the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patient population as well. So again, lenalidomide and rituxan. So again, these patients are gonna now come to your chair, which is wonderful. So this was a study <clears throat> that looked at lenalidomide and rituximab, and so this is called R-squared because it's revlimid and rituximab. Um, verse, so looking at um, R-squared with maintenance, so doing an initial 12 weeks of higher dose and then doing chronic low dose um, in patients with relapsed. And the, these studies initially um, included follicular marginal zone and mantle cell, <clears throat> but 62% overall response rate, okay? So regardless of how many regimens and which drugs patients had had, this was active for these patients. So an initial 12-week induction and then low-dose maintenance. 
So looking more specifically at follicular lymphoma, so this 82% of patients in this um, study had follicular lymphoma, and this was just lenalidomide and rituxan, not maintenance, um, and this pitted this against um, whatever the physician wanted to use. So whatever chemotherapy they wanted to use, R squared was superior. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing more of these patients. Um, maybe you think they're myelomas when they're sitting in your chair, but some of them hopefully are lymphoma patients too. So looking at um, common dosing, 25 milligrams, 20 to 12, oh, thank you, Karen, thank you. I know, I'm so dehydrated from yesterday, I don't think I've caught up from that, <laughs> that power shopping, thank you. <laughs> So 20 to 25 milligrams is the most common starting dose for these uh, patients. And um, these are the common side effects. But you guys know this because you're giving this to myeloma. Um, th they are not different um, for lymphoma than myeloma. The one thing that is the most different is this um, two things, rashes. CLL patients, about 50% of them will develop rashes. And I have had to take patients off this drug because of rashes. Do you see that in myeloma? I don't think so much in myeloma because you're probably giving a steroid with that as well. Tumor flare. So nodes can get bigger before they get smaller and patients need to be ready for that. Uh, tumor lysis syndrome can happen. The other difference between your lymphoma and your myeloma patients is this um, clot, the um, you know, DVT issue. So you know your um, myeloma patients are probably on Lovenox. They're on real anticoagulation. In the lymphoma uh, world, aspirin is typically used. So it's not, it, it is a risk, but not as big as myeloma. So mantle cell, this is, it's active in mantle cell, and this is a five-year follow-up study. So 64% progression-free survival and 77% overall survival at five years. So again, very active in mantle cell lymphoma. Hopefully you're seeing these patients in your chairs. Um, again, these, this, the whole point of this is we are now able to offer patients with many of these B-cell malignancies chemo-free treatment options over and over and over again. So we've now got multiple layers of options for these folks. Um, again, this looked at uh, R squared versus lots of R chemo options. And as you can see, this is response rate. So 58% for non-chemo are R squared, 53% for chemo. But again, more nausea with chemo, more um, neutropenia, more growth factors, more of lots of side effects that our patients don't want to have. So in follicular lymphoma in general, you've seen in CLL and mantle cell, we're using these new drugs like water. They have been slower to come to follicular lymphoma. And the biggest change in follicular lymphoma, in addition to these, um, you know, relapsed refractory, is now obinutuzumab is interchangeable with rituximab in all of our chemo regimens and in our maintenance world. Are you guys giving lots of obinutuzumab? Yes or no? Raise your hands. Yes? Okay, good. So this is why this is happening. Um, their obinutuzumab has been studied against rituximab extensively in follicular lymphoma. Um, it's very active. It tends to have a little better efficacy than rituximab, um, which is why you're seeing more and more of it coming. So this study looked at obinutuzumab versus rituximab with chemo for um, first-line follicular lymphoma. And so as you can see here, this is the obinutuzumab plus chemo. This is rituximab plus chemo. So at three years, progression-free survival, 80% for obinutuzumab, 73 for rituximab. So both of these drugs are very active, but you get a little more bang for your buck with the obinutuzumab, which is why you're seeing more of it being used. The thing that I, that's kind of, we're used to rituxan, right? 
We know how to give it. You know how to dose it. You know what to expect. So I think the biggest challenge with adopting or moving to obinutuzumab is the fact that the dosing is different. Um, and as you can see here, it's different for CLL than it is for follicular lymphoma, right? So with rituximab, we sort of gave it the same way regardless of what the disease was. Not quite the same with obinutuzumab. And then they're in the chair for a few more days during the first cycle. So making the switch is really a different routine, different dosing. Um, but again, this, it, we're doing it because it, the efficacy is higher. So moving on to diffuse large cell, right, which is our, really our most commonly diagnosed B cell malignancy. We've made less progress there, unfortunately. So as you can see, for, I mean, initial therapy is still, CHOP rituxan is still king for, for diffuse large cell. Um, for uh, relapsed refractory, there is a brutinib can be used, lenalidomide can be used, but CAR-T is really the most exciting thing that has happened to diffuse large cell. Have you sent any patients for CAR-T yet? You have? Okay, good. So these are the patients who really grow through everything. These are like your, your highest risk patients. Um, we've got a couple that are approved, ax, ax, axicaptogene, axicell, that's called, and uh, tisogen lecclicel is also approved in diffuse large cell. So just so you guys know this, right, because you're going to be referring patients and they're going to come back to you. And then just so you know, these are the steps. So cells get taken from the patient. They're isolated and genetically engineered, right? And it, this is supposed to take a short amount of time. It can take weeks. It's not supposed to, right? So this lab portion is, is kind of a black hole. Um, and then they get genetically, um, they get genetically modified and then they're put back in the patient where they expand and they respond to the tumor, okay? So anytime you expand cells um, it, in a lab and you're, it's supposed to be infused and attack the tumor, lots of side effects happen. So this is, patients want CAR-T, but I don't think they really understand what CAR-T is. So they want it because in this, uh, patient population with refractory diffuse large B cell, and you know your patients who stop responding, that is a pretty rapidly fatal situation for them. But response rates of 82% and about 50% will achieve a complete response. So patients want these, they want these drugs. What I wanna talk about, and here's another, this one overall response rate of 50%, Here's another one. So these are coming gangbusters. You guys aren't doing this, but you are gonna be sending patients for these and they're gonna come back to you. Um, so this is another drug that actually has much less toxicity that we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, good responses with lower toxicity. So the challenges of CAR-T are that right now it's patient-specific therapy and time is not on the side of these patients. Um, so the current practices, uh, we need to work on different, ooh, sorry. So current um, products, we need to do a better job creating these products to reduce side effects. Um, toxicity management is different from drug to drug. Um, and so you guys aren't doing this. I wasn't sure if you were or not, but these are some of the common things. So cytokine release syndrome, patients are in the hospital they can develop all these side effects, fever, hypotension, hypoxia, really profound cytokine release syndrome. This is um, encephalopathy. They can have uh, pretty significant neuro side effects that tend to just work themselves out. This is treated with steroids mainly. And then this hematophagocytic syndrome that patients can develop. So right now, one of the limiting factors is all of this, because to manage all of this, you have to do this in a transplant center. Um, so we really need to work on making this more user-friendly and less having less toxicity so we can move this approach into practices that aren't um, quite so sophisticated and have all of that supportive uh, care available. This is a checklist, just as an example. 
So patients get cytoxin and fludarabine, um, and then they get their drug, and then you're just looking for the havoc that this is causing. And so I'm sorry you guys aren't doing this, but you will be sending patients for CAR-T, and we're trying to do a better job to have patients not be so sick. So in conclusion, there are so many studies going on. They've been great. We now have all these novel agents for these diseases that I know you guys, I know your physicians are writing these prescriptions and handing them to patients, and your navigator's taking care of it. But they're out there, and they're getting these drugs. We need to do a better job understanding their safety profiles, um, sequencing them. Each of them really does have a unique toxicity profile. And so all of you are really the backbone of education. You've got your navigator doing this, but I really hope you guys are seeing these patients and are gonna be interacting with them because um, these are really good, good drugs. And hopefully the next time I come, everyone is familiar with them. <laughs> okay. Right, because you guys are really the ones that are so critical in adherence and monitoring and all those things. But anyway, thank you. Does does anybody have questions? Yes. Yes. So it's with each dose escalation. So because you guys aren't doing this, I didn't really get into this, but it's, you need a baseline, a pre, so before the dose, six to eight hours after the dose, and 24 hours after the dose. And so what I do is I have patients go the day before. I have them get blood drawn the day before. I have them take their new dose at like between six and eight in the morning. And then we see them in the afternoon. I see them, they have their labs drawn. And then if their labs look okay at six to eight hours, they just come back and get a quick blood draw the next day. So you can sort of um, reduce the fanfare to make it just sort of routine blood work, just checking. But there is um, little to no tumor lysis syndrome with this stepped up dosing. So it sounds really scary, but it's really not. It's, it's just hoops that you need to jump through and make sure that patients are safe but the risk of tumor lysis syndrome has essentially been eliminated with this stepped up schedule. Does anybody else have questions? Okay, well thank you. I hope you have a great day.
let me just my, wire myself up quickly and do a level check because if you're doing the presentation and you're in charge of the tech, that's, that's not easy. Yeah, press that one, see what happens. Okay, that, so levels are good, we can all hear me. You can hear me. The internet can hear me, that's the most important thing, of course. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you too. So um, I will bring up one slide. I don't have a presentation uh, as such, but uh, if I can work this Windows 7 laptop, perhaps I can show you at least uh, a couple of pictures while I'm talking about my case. If I can find them. That's not it. No, that's not. This is me in the hospital. I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Javis Lewis, and I'm super excited to be here. I'm not a doctor, but I've been at the receiving end of the treatment as a, as a cancer patient. And uh, Karen refers to me as a super survivor. And this month is a very exciting month for me. She's given me this T-shirt when my treatment was complete. And my case was a, was a weird one. It was very complicated. It was terrible. It was terrifying. And uh, what, what cured me and why I'm called a super survivor is because the treatment that was successful in my case was, in fact, one of those newfangled drugs called immunotherapy. And... Um, that was not the first line treatment that I received. I also received chemotherapy twice. Neither of them worked. I also received uh, surgery six, six times. <laughs> and I've also received radiation. And all of that combined for about a year and a half, two years, was not successful, was not effective. And I nearly died. I nearly lost my life, bless you. And um, it, that, was, that was kind of the, the, the thing that was, that was so terrifying. My life just kind of went down and down. And then eventually with immunotherapy, it literally took a dramatic turn up. And I want to tell you the whole story and I'll, I'll try and condense it as, as short as possible because once I get started, I kind of can't really stop about it because there were so many nuances to that, uh, to that treatment, to the whole case. It was, um, yeah, so it, it started all... First of all, I had, I've had cancer in my family for many years. My grandmother had it. She had breast cancer. That was in the mid-80s, early 80s. Her, both her sisters had it. And uh, back then, and this is kind of so exciting to look at it from today's point of view, back then in the 80s, cancer was more like a death sentence. There were, there were limited treatment options. The, the only thing that doctors knew for sure was going to work was surgery with large margins. Don't leave the margins too small, large margins. And even then, chemotherapy was available, but were you going to survive? It was also not as convenient as chemotherapy is today. So today, we think of a three-hour transfusion as inconvenient. But back then, I remember my grandmother was in the hospital. She was hospitalized. That was that. Was that. On my father's side, there was, there was a big colon cancer issue. My father had it, his two brothers had it. Uh, it but we didn't make the connection that that was kind of perhaps a genetic link there. So uh, we just knew there was cancer in my family. And that was kind of what brings me to, into today's world, into 2015 when my symptoms started. And it was bizarre at first. It was non-cancer related really. It was something, uh, diarrhea, UTI, weird kind of pain, shivering. So I went to see my primary doctor and he said, let's do, uh, let's do a CT scan to see what's going on in your abdomen. And that came back with, well, there's some kind of infection. Ideally, we'd like to do a colonoscopy, but that's not really possible because you're so infected, we need to wait and cool that infection down. Otherwise, we may perforate the bowel. And uh, we did that, we waited. I had home infusion antibiotics. That was kind of my first brush with the US healthcare system, how that all worked. I've, I've, been, I've been living in London for, for uh, 13 years up until 2012. And then my wife and I moved here to wonderful Miami Beach in sunny Florida. So, and um, 
So the day came, uh, a wonderful doctor named Dr. Para did the colonoscopy and said, I'm so sorry, I could only go in up to about 15 centimeters. There's a giant blockage there in your colon. So sorry, it looks like it's cancer. We, we don't know for sure, but it, I've, I've seen this one too many times. I'm, I'm really sorry to tell you this. This is uh, probably cancer. So lucky for me, I had already spoken to a colon surgeon at um, Baptist Hospital. And uh, he said, uh, I can do surgery next day. So th one day after, that was at the beginning of uh, 2016, January, February, 1st of February, 2016, this was. And he found, in fact, a 20 centimeter large tumor in me. So he thought, wow, that's, that's a lot. But ample margins, cut it out, ended up with a, colonoscopy, with a colostomy for a while. And the plan was, Let's give you first-line treatment of chemotherapy, full FOX, um, oxaliplatin, and uh, you, that, that'll, that'll start until when, when, you, when you're healed up, maybe in about uh, six weeks, eight weeks, we're going to give you six months of chemo, and you'll be back on your feet. <coughs> that was the plan. Didn't, didn't work out so well, I'm afraid to say. Uh, I did the chemo, and I did genetic testing as well. This is important because that kind of leads on to the second part of my story. They did a big genetics test, uh, which concluded that I didn't just have regular colon cancer, because at my age, it was suspected that there may be something genetic going on. So I was 43 at the time. That is fairly young for a cancer patient to have that sort of, that, that big cancer. It wasn't T4, it was T3 only. Uh, so it hadn't metastasized into anything uh, in my body, which is, which is good to know. But um, uh, they did the test. They found out, well, there's two kind of genetic variations there. One was the KRAS mutation, which means my uh, cancer appears to be growing more aggressively, faster. The cells don't appear to know when they're not supposed to reproduce. They just reproduce all the time. They don't know when, when to stop. So that makes the cancer look more aggressive, I believe. I'm not a doctor, as I said. So uh, the other thing that they found out, which was more important, which was mismatch repair syndrome. And that is something uh, in which, uh, from what I understand, when the DNA in your cells replicates, there's a spell checking kind of mechanism that says, hey, um, that DNA isn't perfect. Let's not build a cell around this. Let's discard this. And that system is impaired in me. So that means that's, how, that's why I got cancer at such an early age. And uh, the tragic news is that uh, patients with those two mutations combined are 95% resistant to the chemotherapy drug that I got, which was Fulfox, oxaliplatin. And so my doctor at Baptist Hospital, he knew this. I mean, he, he ordered the test. He knew this, gave me the Fulfox treatment anyway, which is weird if we think about it. But at the same time, I spoke to Dr. Kuznir from Mount Sinai earlier, uh, later, um, later on when my treatment progressed over there. And it turns out that's, that's a political thing that if you're a colon cancer patient, you get given this drug, no matter what the genetics test says. And that is something I, that needs to be addressed. I mean, that's, that's something that's, that's bizarre. Dr. Kuznir told me, well, to be honest with you, I would have had to give you the same treatment and we had to see it fail and then the insurance will approve other treatment options. And you think, oh, that's just ridiculous. I mean, why do genetics tests if you know the outcome of which dictates this medication isn't going to be successful, why give it to the patient anyway? So surprise, surprise, it didn't work. My cancer grew worse. Uh, about a week after my first surgery started, even before I started on chemotherapy, tragic news was that the cancer had, due to proximity, invaded my bladder. So I had it in my bladder. I had colon cancer in my bladder. I had colon cancer in my colon. And that was terrible. So anyway, we started the first uh, chemo treatment, uh, the first full Fox regimen for about eight cycles. And my tumor just regrew. It just grew back in the bladder massive. I, had, I was wearing a catheter at my colostomy, so I was wearing like two plastic things dangling out of me at all times. I had the wonderful side effects of the chemotherapy, and my life was just getting from bad to worse. And on top of that, the, the tumor had regrown. So what are we going to do? Well, says my doctor at Baptist Hospital, 
yeah, sorry, we can't help you anymore. We really don't know what this is, how to fix it. We don't have the staff at Baptist to take your whole bladder out because that's the only thing we can do at this point. Radical cystectomy, so you're going to a colostomy and a urostomy, probably forever, but we don't know who can do it, so see ya. I, I don't know. He was the most depressed person in, in, that I've ever seen. I mean, I understand doctors and hardship and, you know, you see patients and patients die and th those are terrible cases. I understand that. But if you go to a hardware store and you say, do you sell oranges? They say, no, the supermarket across the road, they, they do that. But an oncologist at one of the big hospitals in the greater Miami area said, no, don't know, really. Don't you, don't you have colleagues? Don't you know anybody who can? Anyway, so we were on our own, which was terrible. Uh, and we were faced with possibly a radical cystectomy. I didn't know where else to go. And um, lucky for me, we had a good urologist who says, hey, I don't do cystectomies, but call this guy. My urologist said that, not my oncologist. And he said, call this guy. He does all my cystectomies for me, which was crazy. I was thinking about how many cystectomies is that, really? So... Um, 20 a day or not. So anyway, we were referred to Dr. Casso, and uh, Dr. Casso works at Mount Sinai, worked at Mount Sinai at that point. And we went to see him, and he says, hey, maybe I won't do much of anything for you, because uh, go see Dr. Koritsky, go see Dr. Kuznir at Mount Sinai. Those are my <laughs> colleagues. Maybe they can help you. Maybe a radical cystectomy isn't even necessary. So that was good. That was the first glimmer of hope that we had there. And um, we went to see Dr. Kuritsky. He's a radiation oncologist. And he said, you know, first of all, sorry about your treatment. <laughs> That's the number one. But number two, my buddy Mike Kuzny knows more about this than I do. But I think your two mutations that prevent the chemo from working makes you a perfect candidate for immunotherapy. And we thought, ooh, that's exciting. Let's speak with this Dr. Mike Kuzny and see what happens. And, uh, we did, and Dr. Kuzny said, yes, actually, I can probably get you into a clinical trial uh, of, of uh, something that may help you. But before we do that, I'd like you to undergo a second chemotherapy regimen, which was irinotecan. So that was for theory. And we did that in, com in combination with, uh, with radiation therapy. And that kind of shrunk the tumor, from, which had regrown from, so from 20 down to zero, had regrown during chemotherapy back to 12 centimeters. Crazy. And due to the radiation, it had shrunk again to six. That was good. So that was something that we thought, well, okay, maybe, maybe you know, we've, we've got, uh, we've, we're kind of on a, good, uh, on a good trip here. Let's see if this, if this keeps, uh, if, if, this, if this makes me healthy. Sadly, it did not. So, uh, it, it, although it did shrink the tumor, my cancer was still doing all kinds of havoc in my abdomen. So, for example, I now had a fistula between what used to be my uh, my disconnected rectum, oh, sorry, my disconnected rectum and my bladder. Fistula number one. That was that was uncomfortable. As the treatment progressed, that my cancer kept growing despite the chemotherapy, I had developed a second fistula, this time from my small intestine to my bladder. So this was absolutely outrageous. This was, I, was, I was getting weaker and weaker, and it came to the point where any food intake would reinfect me. And what, what kind of, not only was the cancer growing, I was also dealing with infections just due to food intake because everything that shouldn't be connected was connected there. Absolutely traumatic and terrible. It got so bad that, uh, that I, was, I was so weak we had to go back to hospital and see if there was another surgical option that they could do. But I was literally on the verge of dying there. I was, it was just going down and down. And uh, both Dr. Zomstein was my colon surgeon and uh, Dr. Kuznir and Karen and uh, Dr. Koritsky, all of them together, we were all working on this, on this, on this tragic case across two hospitals. It was very exciting. And uh, Dr. Kuznir recommended, let's take food out of the equation and give you uh, TPN, total parenteral nutrition. So I don't take any food by mouth anymore. I'm getting it through my port. So I was no longer eating. I wasn't, I, was, I wasn't sleeping anymore. I had to go up for a pee every 15 minutes, day or night. And I was severely weakened, so, so weakened, in fact, that 
further chemo treatment wasn't even an option anymore. And I was, I was, I was so weak when we went to see Dr. Kuzner again in uh, early 2017, we're talking uh, February, just after I'd been released from hospital. I had a walking stick to barely move forward. Julia wheeled me across the hospital in a wheelchair just so that, that I could go from A to B. I, I literally, I couldn't stand up anymore. Everything that's liquid in you just flows right into your bladder if everything's connected. It was absolutely horrendous. And um, Dr. Kuzni said, let's, let's, let's play my trump card. Let's do immunotherapy. We, we have no other options. This has got to work. But would it? That was the big question. Would it, would it work? Because that's the issue, even though the drugs are new, some that small subset of patients exhibit amazing results, but many other people have, have bad side effects from what I understand. So early February, I'm barely walking. I'm, I'm, I'm unable to do literally anything. And Dr. Kuznir gives me uh, Keytruda, the immunotherapy drug that cured my life. It's ex from a patient's point of view, an an awesome change of events already. So there's the, the chemotherapy, three hours plus infusion in the suite. Amazing side effects, hair loss, diarrhea, just nausea, all, all, the, all the candidates. Compared to the immunotherapy infusion, which was 30 minutes. Very exciting. 30 minutes in the infusion suite. Didn't feel like anything. Looks like a, like a, like a 250 milliliter clear saline bag. It's, it's done within 30 minutes. Amazing. No side effects. Fantastic, I thought. That's great. Was it going to work? Well, we're going to find out. So it'll be, it was, uh, that was early February, and we, we, we did one infusion every three weeks, was it? After three treatments, not much of a change. Fourth treatment, I feel a little better. I can sleep a little longer. I can, those daily walks I was doing that were like literally snail pace around the block just to get a little bit of exercise, they were now uh, possible again, longer and longer. I was feeling literally better every day come end of March. Beginning of April, I felt so good within a course of two months from starting the immunotherapy. Within two months that I could barely walk at all to I can walk at a regular pace again. I, want the, I, I can't adequately describe the mental change that gave me, just the mood change. You're getting better. That's something I hadn't seen in a long time. And it just carried on from there, the fourth treatment, fifth treatment. I was just getting better literally every day, even though the treatments were, were spaced out. So Karen said, even if you don't feel anything right away, it doesn't mean we're going to give you saline solution. We're not giving you the good stuff. It is the good stuff. It just takes a long time for the body to repair the damages and reverse the damages. And it worked. It worked absolutely flawlessly. It's amazing. It's a great, great transformation that was. And uh, it, was, it went so well. I, I don't know if you, can, uh, if you can see that. This has kind of gone to sleep now, hasn't it? It has. I was going to show you a picture of me riding my bicycle. I guess it has it's kind of gone to sleep there. I, was, I rode my bike end of April 2017 after only, what was it, four treatments? I, four or five treatments? I was so fit that I could go on my bike again and cycle the distance from where we live on 2nd Street in Miami Beach all the way up to Manzana Hospital on 43rd Street. That is amazing. What a transformation. And so we decided, okay, we're going to leave this, these treatments up. They're obviously, they're good for you. Let's, let's keep them going. And end of the year, we're going to have to put all the plumbing back. So we're going to have to take the, the colostomy back. We may have to do a partial cystectomy to reconnect all the bits that were now connected that weren't supposed to be. Wean me off the TPN. Remember, I still wasn't eating at that time. It was still the, the uh, artificial nutrition that I was getting. 13-hour infusions overnight. Terrible ordeal. So... Um, the day came of the big surgery. I think it was in October 2017. And it was at, at Baptist Hospital. We had two top-class surgeons working together there. A colon surgeon, my, my Dr. Zomstein, my colon surgeon, and my urologist, Dr. Casso, had now transferred 
to <laughs> Baptist Hospital. They were in the middle of building up their big uh, new cancer center, which wasn't available at the time I was undergoing the chemo treatment there. And it's probably one of the reasons why I switched to Mount Sinai. And these guys, they put me under, opened me up. Obviously, I was unconscious at the time, but when I came to again, the stories they told me were magnificent. They had me open, and it's such a shame they didn't take video footage of it, otherwise I would have brought it with me today. They opened me up and, and looked at the mess that the cancer had left. And the, the most amazing thing was that they didn't find cancerous tissue in me anymore. So you've got to appreciate what happened there. Not only was I severely diseased, not six months before, the immunotherapy helped my body put me back together, almost like on a molecular level, on a cellular level, that the cancer had, had just gone. It had attacked. My own immune system had attacked whatever ridiculous crap was going on in there and just reversed the process. It couldn't quite put the fistula back to where it wasn't supposed to be, so the surgeons had to do that. But they were both equally amazed to see this stuff is gone. It's no longer there. I no longer had cancer. And that was the most amazing transformation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what is so magnificent for me to be here today is that it is April, and this kind of the, the, the first uh, step into this new direction, into this transformation, literally happened in April 2017. That's when we realized, my goodness, this stuff is working. This is working brilliantly. This was, this was only two years ago. And I'm here today. I'm listening to all your wonderful talks and, and your wonderful input, uh, the amazing new drugs that, that are coming out left, right, and center for all types of cancer. I was just, we're live on the internet with this. I was just speaking to uh, one of my viewers, Christina McKay. Hello, Christina, by the way. She's in Germany. She's had a traumatic experience herself. And she just told me in the chat that she was so super sad to speak to a 10-year-old girl in the rehab center who had a brain tumor. And she knew she was going to die because there were no treatment options available for the type of cancer she had. And I just, and my heart goes out to that little girl. I, I, just, I just hope, and I mean, what we see today, I, I think it's going to become a reality that with these new drugs, I, a super survivor, am the living proof that these things work. And they don't just work, they work incredibly well. I think that's all I wanted to share with you today. So <laughs> thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Can't <remember. laughs> Thank you. Go sell your book. Okay. I'll try. You look so good. It's oh so my wonderful goodness. to see you. You too. Oh. So nice to see you. I'm glad you're doing a presentation too. You're the guy awesome. who got me. The oh, guy hey. Who like How are you doing?
myself since Karen doesn't want to introduce me. Uh, my name is Simon Abiyad. I'm a medical oncologist. I'm currently with Florida Cancer Specialists in Naples, Florida. And I will be making the transition back to the East Coast to join Florida Precision Oncology, which will be in Aventura and in Boca Raton. Um, today, I was asked to talk about something called molecular intelligence, mostly next generation sequencing. It's a little bit of a dry subject, so I'll try to make it as, um, you know, uh, fun as possible. So my disclosures, I'm at the Keras Speaker Bureau, and this is where we started. When I was in med school, we used to get, uh, and that was a long time ago, <laughs> but um, when we were introduced to lung cancer, they told us that we had adenocarcinoma, large cell, small cell, and squamous cell carcinoma. And then as I started my residency and then my fellowship, things started to get more and more complicated. And then we started going into molecular subtypes. So then we came up with, we found the EGFR. I think it was back in 2005, and then we got a target for it. And then we found the ALK, and then we found ROS1, and then we found the RET, and then we found the HER2, and then we found the BRAF, and then we found the KRAS. And we're still going. There's still, uh, there's the MET14. We're, we're still going on with these things. And they changed the whole perspective of how we treat cancer. Because now, we test for this genomic profile and based on it, I always like it when I tell a patient, we're not gonna give you chemo, we're gonna give you a pill. And um, they, they think, oh, they're gonna treat my cancer with a pill, which is kinda true, because we're, you know, we're going for a targeted therapy. What they don't think about is that this pill can have more side effects than chemo, but that's for another talk. Um, so, but this is what we've been facing, and I'm going to bring this up because um, one of the challenges that I've had, I've had a, a stint with pharma a few years ago, and I was responsible for, one of the products I was responsible for was bevacizumab. And bevacizumab is an anti-VEGF drug. It works on a target. It has a target, but the idea is we have never and we still don't have a way to test for VEGF. So even if the patient comes back, and I'm, I'm just going to give the example, EGF, uh, VGEF positive, which isn't a thing, but anyway. And they tried to do trials of that sort, and they found out that it has no meaning. We cannot follow that target. So the response rates for uh, bevacizumab have not been as great as you would think because we didn't really have a specific target. But then you look on other drugs, and let's just say a CD20 targeted therapy such as rituximab, and you see if a patient is CD20 positive, we have a very high likelihood that this patient is gonna res respond. If a patient is KRAS wild type, we know that they're gonna respond to cetuximab, panitumumab, and other drugs. So the more we can narrow the target, the better our drugs are gonna work, and these are not cheap drugs. These are extremely expensive drugs, so throwing a 10,000 drug a month on a pa at a patient, not knowing if this patient is gonna respond or not, is costing the community a lot of money and not really helping the patient. Precision, we talk about precision medicine. Uh, everywhere you, you hear personalized care, precision medicine, all of that stuff, precision oncology, and we, use that word, we overuse that word in oncology because we are the leaders in it. We are the people who have created this, uh, this discipline of pharmacolo uh, pharmacology and medicine, and we are still and we remain the leaders in that particular field. So, as you all, I heard uh, there's a whole lot of nurse practitioners here, and uh, I don't know if there's doctors, but what we have, wh whenever we talk about next generation sequencing, NGS, it's been, it has become standard practice. A patient comes in, we get a t tissue biopsy, and then we send their tissue to a company to do next generation sequencing. 
Um, there's several on the market. I'm going to name a few. It's a non-exhaustive uh, uh, list. There's Keras, there's Foundation One, there's Tempest, there's et cetera, et cetera. And they each have their own way of doing things. But what is the ideal next generation sequencing that we are looking for for our patients? And I'll explain how this important com uh, importance comes into play. We can find a target through several ways. And these are all lab assays. And this is what I'm not going to get into because it's dry, it's annoying, and, and nobody uh, cares except the people who do it. But, anyway, <laughs> but um, the first thing we need to look at is sequence the DNA, sequence the genome, right? But then the genome has parts of it that are not really the active, the main disease drivers. So we have the RNA, which is kind of a consequence of the genome. And then you have the resultant of the DNA to RNA to protein, which is the protein expression. So if we want to go back historically, we have done a good job testing for protein because we have immunohistochemistry, which is something that can be done at your local path lab. And you know, they put a stain, they do something, they find out, oh, the patient has an expression of CD20. But then things got a little bit more complicated, and then we, we couldn't really use IHC for everything. So we started using sequencing and RNA sequencing, and uh, we kind of perfected our technique. So how does next generation sequencing work? We send the patient for a biopsy. We get the biopsy, whether bone marrow or tissue. Uh, we send uh, a paper to the lab. We tell them we want next generation sequencing, and this patient has lung cancer, for example. The lung cancer tissue is, uh, they call the lab where the biopsy was done. They take it to their centralized lab. They use high-end techniques that I discussed to sequence all that they need to do. And then they analyze that information because you're going to get a lot of things. And unfortunately, what we know right now is the tip of the iceberg. So sometimes when I'm doing genetic counseling on a patient and, for example, in breast, and these patients don't come back as BRCA1 or BRCA2 or PALB2, B2, or when they come in for unknown mutations, or uh, the report would usually say no identifiable known mutations. And what I tell the patient, and, and, and that's a patient that had like two breast cancer and her whole family had breast cancer. And what I tell this patient is that I know you're getting something that says no and that everything is fine, but uh, we don't know everything. And there's things that we still don't know. And if you look at those reports and details, you see um, a mutation of unknown significance. So it's a lot more, uh, we still don't know much. So, but anyway, what these labs do, and, 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 and I think it's a great thing, and all of them do it. They analyze the data that they have, they compare, they look at studies, and then they come back, they come back to you and they say, you know what, we found these things, we think these are um, um, alterations or mutations or targets that you can use, whether in the, in the sense of a clinical trial or even that you have a drug on the market that you can use for it. So the NCCN, um, for them to accept a next generation sequencing and to recommend it, they have put in a lot of criteria, and it all comes down to the same thing. You got to go from DNA to protein. So you have the IHC, you have the RNA sequencing, you have the DNA sequencing, and there's the other stuff that are a little bit too complicated and not really used in the clinical world. They're used in the research world. But as you can see, from RNA sequencing alone, we can find targets for, and that's a non-exhaustive uh, non -exhaustive list, for, for targeted therapies. And then in IHC alone, you can, and this is also non-exhaustive, you can find out if the patient has PD-L1 positive. And whether this patient will respond to immunotherapy or not. And then you have the DNA sequencing, which is going to show you EGFR, ALK, RAS, uh, and all the other stuff. This is an example 
and I'm sorry, I, I don't know if it's very visible, but this is an example of a next generation sequence and uh, sequencing company and what they do for different types of cancers. So for example, let's take breast cancer. The IHC will give you androgen receptors, hormone receptors, HER2, um, MMR, PDL1, and other stuff. But then they kind of double down on that with, they look for mutations, they look for MSI, which I will discuss later, tumor burden, fusion analysis, and uh, um, deleterious mutations. So, that's just an example of the genes that are tested. You have all these genes. You have 592 genes. And then for the RNA, and there's different techniques. There's hotspot and there's whole transcript uh, transcriptome. But uh, the hotspot doesn't cover um, intronic, okay. It doesn't cover areas where the RNA is not expressed. It's, it's a little bit of a different technique, but basically the whole trans, uh, transcriptome sequences all of the RNA that you have. So the RNA cannot hide when you have fusions or other variations. So I'm going to start with immune checkpoint inhibitors, and I'm going to talk about what the progress that we, have this, uh, that we have made with these drugs, and some of them are getting approvals based on things that are different than PDL1. And as we have practiced more, we have realized that PDL1 doesn't really change the course of things. And there's several things that come into play. You have the microsatellite instability, you have the tumor burden, tumor mutational burden, and you have the PDL1. And initially, when we first discovered immunotherapy, we thought that PDL1 was the all be all. And actually, the drugs, if you look at their clinical trials, they were made in a way where if a patient is PDL1 negative, they would not be part of the trial. And then all of a sudden, we realized that no, as a matter of fact, you can include these patients in your trials, and they actually still benefit. So, Tumor mutational burden, it's, uh, I, I'll just give the example of head and neck cancer, you have a patient, or lung cancer, you have a patient that has smoked their entire life. We all know that cigarettes are mutagenic or whatever. Um, <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I have a little bit of an accent if you didn't pick up on that. Uh, <laughs> so, um, these patients, they have been causing insult and injury to their DNA all their lifetime. So they have a lot of mutations that the DNA eventually cannot fix. And they develop something called a mutational burden. And then one day, um, this, two, this lung cell or this head and neck cell is going to say, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to go crazy, and I'm going to become a cancer. So uh, yeah, so this is how it is. Uh, and then these patients have usually lung cancer patients and head and neck patients who have been smoking their entire lives have a high tumor mutational burden. What does that mean, though? It means that that cancer has very abnormalities. So when the immune system is policing our body, looking for what's normal and what's abnormal, uh, it's kind of like a freak walking around, and they're gonna, uh, the immune system is going to pick up on it, especially if you help it out with a little bit of immune ther uh, therapy that will uncover these, these weird cells. Um, and MSI, MSI is not something that you kind of sign up for. It's something that you are, I would say, born with. And it's the DNA repairing itself. And um, the DNA has something called a mismatch repair system, which is, uh, which is fascinating how nature works. Um, the DNA polices itself when it's replicating. And when it picks up that there's something that doesn't make sense, um, it does something which is called a repair. It repairs it. And if it cannot repair itself, it actually 
kills that cell which is trying to replicate. Unfortunately, in a subset of people, we have that instability. So the body kind of doesn't do the best job at picking up at those mismatches. And over the course of years, you have more and more abnormal cells which develop into cancer. But they're also unique, and the immune system can uncover them. And this is why immune therapy works in this particular type of patient. PDL1, uh, the way I, I tell my patients what it is, because people ask, how does immunotherapy work? And I try to simplify things as much as I can. And this is what I came up with. I came up with that um, the immune system is kind of like a police. It's walking around and it's asking for IDs. And every one of us needs to show them our ID. Cancer carries a fake ID. Um, but then the police does not really have, uh, you know, the thing they use at the club. <laughs> <laughs> so it just falls for it, right? Um, and it always happens to me. I go there, and they don't believe I'm, I'm uh, uh, they think I'm younger than 21, and I'm like, no, I'm not. But anyway, uh, but, <laughs> but um, what immunotherapy does, if you want to simplify it, is that it gives the immune system that power to identify a fake ID. And when it identifies the fake ID, it will do its job and take this cancer away. So, um, just to show you how, how much of a difference these three things do. Um, you have a lung cancer patient. If he has a little bit of an expression of PDL1, that's the example of PDL1, and you give this patient pembrolizumab, which is an immune therapy, you're going to see that they're not going to get that great of a benefit. They, uh, their median isn't that fascinating. If you have a patient with more than 50% of its cells expressing PDL1, all of a sudden our overall survival is superior to chemotherapy. So if you have a patient who has more than 50% PDL1 positive cells and you give them an immune therapy, chances are they're going to do much better than with chemotherapy in addition to much less side effects. So, and this was a presentation at ASCO this past year where they discussed that and um, it was a plenary session. So that, that's a big achievement in treating cancer for us. And mind you, these patients respond for a very long time. So you are getting like triple the overall survival in patients who respond. Now, colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer, PDL1 doesn't really do much. The main difference has always been MSI, and uh, which is microsatellite instability, the ability of the body to, co to correct itself. Um, we, for the longest, when we used to give uh, um, chemotherapy, we always had this struggle where we knew about MSI years ago. And when we would, we always had this, there's a small early stage subgroup of patients that, who have MSI, these patients don't do well with chemotherapy. They don't do well with chemotherapy for various reasons. One of it is that the normal tissue cannot correct itself after it's hit with chemotherapy. So basically, you cannot correct the damage and you're kind of almost doing more damage by giving these patients chemotherapy. And then you have uh, so there's a subgroup of patients who had MSI with early stage colon cancer that we would not recommend adjuvant therapy to these patients. We would say, we don't think it's going to do you uh, good. As a matter of fact, it will do you harm. Until we got immunotherapy involved. And now our patients who have colon cancer have this wonderful new advancement where instead of a patient having a stage 4 colon cancer and look how quickly they their progression happens in three months, even less if you take the median. Now with patients who are MSI and you give them pembrolizumab, which is also an immune therapy, we have 
change the whole paradigm of colon cancer. And then the tumor mutational burden, bladder cancer is one of those cancers that, again, is uh, induced by smoking or by other chemicals. And so they have a lot of, uh, a lot of mutations in that cancer. And you can see that atezolizumab, which is another immune therapy, also has changed the paradigm in treating these patients. So, I think I talked about this quite, quite a lot, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, to test for tumor mutational burden, this is, what, this is what's happening. We don't have a standard yet. So every company claims that they test for it, and every company gives you a report that says high, low, medium. But every company's high, low, medium is different. And we don't have a standard yet. There's not a single test that says, oh, these guys are right or these guys are not right. So what's happening with that is that um, there, was a, there was an immune therapy combination that was going to be approved based on tumor mutational burden. And um, the FDA approval was imminent. And then that company had to retract its FDA application because of the fact that they couldn't really tell them what is a high tumor mutational burden. Microsatellite instability, this slide tells you how historically we used to test for it. So what we used to do, we used to use PCR, which would miss a little bit of the MSI patients. Now with next generation sequencing, there is no way we can miss it. Look at the data. You have, if you take PCR versus next generation sequencing, you can see that we have increased the sensitivity to 100% and the specificity to 99.9%. .9 PDL1, this is kind of talking shop, but there's five FDA, I don't know if it's the FDA, I don't know. Yeah, five, uh, three FDA approved diagnostic. Uh, assays for PDL1 and for five different disease types. And you have to use the correct assay for the correct patient. For example, and that's something that also some companies are capitalizing on. For example, for atezolizumab, which is an immune therapy drug that was approved in combination with, the, with NAB, Paclitaxel. It, it wasn't, a, it's not approved yet, but the data is out and it will be. In triple negative breast cancer, an area of unmet need, we have not had any progress in that particular disease area. And immunotherapy trials have failed us uh, countless of times in triple negative breast cancer. And then finally, we had this, uh, you know, this beacon of hope where atezolizumab was found to be effective in, in a particular subgroup of triple negative patients who have a PDL1 positive expression, but the study was made with the SP142 Ventana, and that is the only assay that would allow you to get atezolizumab uh, in these patients. So if I go to an insurance company or a payer and I tell them I did the DACO assay on a breast cancer patient, they tell me we're not gonna give you atezolizumab because the FDA approval is gonna come out by SP142 Ventana. Now, I'm gonna touch up on the NTREC fusion. That's, uh, that was the first, and that is the first, FDA approved drug that is agnostic. So, this drug has no place in America. No. <laughs> It's an agnostic drug, and what that means is that the study was not made to target a specific, a specific type of cancer. It was only based on patients who had an NTRK or NTREC gene fusion, which was, I would say, a very, um, 
a very smart way to do things, but also a very risky way of doing things because we know for a fact that there's mutations in, for example, um, a HER2 positive lung cancer patient. The early data did not show a benefit of trastuzumab in those patients. So we don't use trastuzumab in lung, ca in lung cancer patients except in very particular clinical trial, um, uh, hyper-specialized circumstances. So this drug that came out, larotrectinib, um, took all incomers with NTREC mutation and we tested the drug on them and the efficacy was regardless of tumor type and as a matter of fact what's really amazing about this drug because our pediatric population gets the drugs really late because we're afraid to test things on children but why not by not testing them on children we're denying them uh, uh, hope so they took pediatric and adult cancer patients and they just gave it to everybody and it works unfortunately it only works in less than 1% of our patients. So it's not like everyone will get an NTREC mutation. So NTREC is a hot topic with all NGS uh, providers. And the reason is they all have different claims. Some of them, uh, first of all, when it first came out, uh, there's NTREC 1, 2, and 3. And when it first came out, um, everyone said, oh, we test for it already. And then once you start looking at the intricacies of the test, they test for NTREC 1 or NTREC 1 and 2, and they miss one of them. And um, some of them even miss the resistant mutations which are essential for you to get the drug because if you have a, a resistant mutation to that particular drug you can't use the drug so some companies didn't even test for those so it, it made it a little harder I mean we already have less than 1% of these patients getting the drug and now we're, we're kind of narrowed down a little more because we're missing a good bunch of these patients so the best way to do it is with full trans transcriptome sequencing because that way you will cover all the mutations, all the resistant mutations, and when the mutation tries to hide in a particular type of fusion, you will catch it. Now, I'm going to tell you a story of one patient who I've seen. Um, he's a 54-year-old man who smoked his entire life and then went to um, a very highly well-renowned um, cancer center. And the patient was started immediately on chemoimmunotherapy without NGS testing because he was told it's squamous cell carcinoma. And we don't test squamous cell carcinoma for mutation. He failed, he blew through his first line, and then they started putting him, as we all know, on clinical trials. Failed one, failed the other, and then they told him, go to hospice. So he came to see me in, in my small clinic for a second opinion, but what do I know? So, so I sent an next generation sequencing on his initial tumor. And it came back with an exon 14 mutation and a BRCA1 mutation. And he was negative for PDL1. So this patient, and this is going to show up as my presentation goes further, if you have a targetable mutation, immunotherapy works very badly. So this patient did not do well with any of the chemo immunotherapy uh, uh, things that they gave him because he had an actionable mutation which is treated with crizotinib. So I gave him crizotinib. He had a 
great response on it for seven months. And then after that, I made my way to get him Olaparib, which targets BRCA1, even though it is not approved. But this is a CME talk. And he had stable disease for another five months. And he eventually passed away. But I, I don't know what would have happened if we started this in reverse. So if he had received the targeted therapy initially, maybe he would have lived longer. And what I want you all to think about is that next generation sequencing should and is the standard of care in 2019. Um, whoever the doctor is, if you're working under the supervision of a physician, whoever it is, if he tells you no need to do it because blah, 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 just ignore it. Okay. Uh, smile and wave and go fill out the form. And, and so we, I send next generation sequencing on all my patients. So we've made strides. We went from IHC to we're sequencing the whole DNA and RNA genome. We still don't know a lot. Those 592 genes that I spoke about are nothing compared to what still remains in hiding. But slowly but surely, at least now we can see them. Before that, we couldn't see them. Now we're seeing them. And w there's people in the background analyzing what these things that are showing up mean. Uh, we have perfected the techniques, and we're still perfecting them. Now we have more accurate results, which are helping us um, have more, uh, a, a more we, we can zoom in more on our targets and we can follow them with therapy. And basket trials, I believe, are going to become the standard of clinical trials in the future. And what is basket trials? Basket trials that they take, like the Entrec drug, they take patients with a certain mutation and they go after it. And there's actually a huge clinical trial happening uh, by the NIH, and it's called the, uh, the MATCH trial. And what the MATCH trial is, it's also an agnostic trial. And what they take, they take the mutation, and they treat it with a target. And they want to see if we can change how we see cancer. So instead of me presenting the case with um, invasive ductal carcinoma of the breast, it will become adenocarcinoma with mutation X and Y and Z. And I treated it with this target instead of treating it as a breast cancer. So this might change how we talk about cancer, how we treat cancer, and then I have to go through fellowship again. <laughs> so I'm going to speak about um, comprehensive liquid biopsy, which I also find to be amazing. Um, here's what I face in clinic every day. I send a patient. I had this breast cancer patient who, can, who came up to me, and I did a biopsy, and she had triple negative breast cancer, even though it's a relapse of a hormone-positive breast cancer she had a few years ago. It's not unheard of. It happens. Um, but then I wanted to send to get more information. Like I said, I send it on all my patients. I wanted to send next-generation sequencing to find out what's going on with this patient. Um, my biopsy for her relapse was from a lymph node. So I sent it to the lab, and the lab came back to me and told me, not enough tissue. So at this point, I'm stuck. Do I send this lady for another biopsy? We all work with cancer patients, and it just, you need to, like, you can, you need to barely touch them because they're already so fragile when it comes to their state of mind and whatever. And then when, when you tell them, oh, you know what, that biopsy, I need another biopsy, it's going to create even more psychological distress on them. And I try to avoid those things. Um, and I'll go back to what we do for these patients. But what happened here is that this study found out that out of 5,688 advanced non-small cell lung cancer patients, less than 50% were 
were treated for their ALK and EGFR mutations, which is ridiculous, right? And why? And I'll tell you why. Um, I get a patient. He has pleural effusion. He's dyspneic. He has 10 things going on. And I need to send uh, NGS on him. NGS turnaround time, I would say, is about 10 days. 10 days, I need to, um, in medical terms, dry him out from his pleural effusion. So what I end up doing is starting chemo. When I start him on a non-targeted treatment, chemo immunotherapy, my goal is to relieve his symptoms acutely, and I cannot wait 10 days. And in 10 days, they might come back not enough tissue, right? So I start him on um, like kind of an empiric treatment, but what I'm missing in this patient is that this patient might have a mutation, just like our previous patient, and then he's not going to respond, and then I'm going to play catch up with his disease, and then, and then he's going to eventually, I'm going to eventually lose him. So, so these are the limitations of um, uh, next generation sequencing tissue samples. This is an example of a lady who is 64. She was found, she came in for a stroke, was found to have a lung mass. They did an EBUS. They found a lung carcinoma. Just to let you know, EBUS is not the greatest thing to get tissue biopsy. Usually they end up getting an FNA or whatever just to let me know, oh, that's cancer. So there wasn't enough tissue to do genomic testing on this patient. And she was treated and, uh, with conventional therapy, and then she started progressing. And then what do we do? So this is where liquid biopsy comes into play. And that's a blessing, right? You send the patient, they're in your lab. You're in, they're in your office. And then they draw, lab on, uh, they draw blood on them. They send them, and this patient, for example, after seven days turnaround time, came back with an EGFR L858R, which was at the time responsive to erlotinib. It is still, and, which is a targeted therapy. And this patient had a good year of life, which we couldn't have offered her had we uh, not done this. So treatment delays, because you're going to wait 10 days. And then they're going to send you a fax, or they may not. And then you have to call them, where's the tissue? Oh, we're still processing it. This could take up to three weeks. And I've had sometimes patients who ended up waiting three weeks to get their tissue. Or, or something as simple as that. We've been calling the pathology lab for the past week. And the secretary is not answering. Or, you know, she's, uh, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so. Um, we have always have a finite resource with tissue, and we're doing so much testing on tissue that we're exhausting it time and again. We have the patient burden. Um, if I'm going for a lung biopsy, lung biopsies have complications. Pneumothorax, hemothorax, uh, uh, burst of bleb, I don't know. So it's easier to get a blood draw than to get a biopsy. And then like I said, the practice burden, because the pathologist needs to be aware to, you know. And this is another study, and it showed that we don't catch a lot of these patients. And only eight patients were tested for all seven recommended alterations. And the reason why is the pathologist looking at the tissue in front of them have to prioritize what what they can, what they can, what they want to test on. So only 8% of patients get the full panel. Because of that, and I talked about this, look at the difference in response. From 60 to 70%, we're dropping to 14%, 4%, 13%, 7% response rates, whereas we could have these patients respond more than 70% of the time. So while we're waiting for this tissue, do we start 
chemo, uh, chemo immuno? Do we start targeted therapy? What do we do? And like I said, it's a simple blood, blood draw. And what it does, it capitalizes on circulating tumor DNA. There's two ways of doing this. Uh, you catch actual tumor cells in the bloodstream, or you just catch the DNA that they're shedding. DNA is the, that the tumor sheds, it sheds it when it goes through apoptosis, necrosis, duplication, um, whatever it is, it's shedding DNA into the bloodstream and we can catch it now. So that's, when I, when I first was introduced to liquid biopsies, I, I, I thought it was mind blowing and I started sending it on everyone and then my program director had, was like, ah, that's not how we do it. So, so, so I was like, ah, you know, no, no, you, breast cancer, you don't need a biopsy, I'll just send a liquid biopsy. <laughs> so um, these are all you know, technicalities, but what I would say is that different labs use different techniques and they, uh, some labs catch uh, cellular uh, cells and some labs catch circulating tumor. This is a list of an example of a liquid biopsy assay and uh, that particular assay is in guidelines. It's approved by Medicare, Medicaid, so it is, I would say, uh, I, I, let's just say I personally don't know of another one, not because, just because it is uh, FDA and NCCN endorsed and all of that stuff. And look at the mut uh, mutations they cover. They cover all of these things, which is fantastic. You're getting ALK, BRAF, EGFR. All the targetable mutations are covered by a single blood draw. Now, again, we know that tissue fails a lot of times because of limited resources and all of that. So what do we do? Do we accept it as a, you know, and no, we don't. We go through liquid biopsies. And when do we add liquid biopsies to our workup? First of all, are liquid biopsies as accurate as tissue biopsies, uh, next generation sequencing? And this was 6,948 6, patients. And they, take my word for it, they, they, <laughs> they took them and they compared tissue to liquid, and they found out that you have a concordance of 98 to 100%. And this is what we found. This was very interesting. We found out that cell-free DNA, which is the liquid biopsy, versus tissue biopsy, and this is what they found. And they kind of did it in reverse. They took liquid biopsies first, and then they biopsied the tissue, and then they took tissue first, and then they did the blood draw, and they compared the results separately to see which one is better. And what they found out is that they're both just as good when it comes to specificity and diagnostic ac accuracy, but what they realized is that tissue has a sensitivity of 80%, liquid biopsy has a sensitivity of 80 to 85 percent. So this one is missing 20 percent, and this one is missing 20 percent. And that was a concern, and this is what we came up with. We came up with, they came back and they looked at the data. Are they missing the same thing? And uh, thankfully, the answer was no. One catches one thing, the other one misses. So the 20 percent in the tissue area is not the
Any other question? And this I just go for. Exactly. And then if you this is a point? No, it's the top one. If you hold the, if you hold that down, that's the... That's okay, the good. Thank you. If you need one minute, that'll just put something up. Okay. Oh, boy. Okay, Jay? Okay. Isn't that amazing, this guy? RJ. Oh my goodness, it's so amazing being here. Thank you, Karen, for giving me the opportunity. And um, I hope we one day get to treat cancer, not to treat it, but cure it. And, uh, but today we are so much improving with uh, therapies. Patients live longer with a better quality of life. I have also an accent. Um, um, uh, this presentation is about immune therapies, which is the latest um, 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 generation on treatment, uh, treating cancer today. And, and I think it's amazing how our patients live longer with better quality of life, like I mentioned before. Um, some of the things that we'll be touching today would be immune therapies and some of the modalities that we use uh, to treat cancer. Um, I heard somebody said that long ago that there are more people living today than they have ever died. I didn't believe that, and I searched it, and it's true. So that's what cancer treatments do today, especially uh, immunotherapies. Um, some of the cancer modalities uh, that uh, been, have been used to, to treat cancer include surgery, radiation therapy, external or internal radiation, chemotherapy, and that includes our biological or immune therapies and uh, clinical trials as well as the uh, alternative therapies. Uh, to better understand immune therapies, we have to speak about the immune system. And I like to use uh, Dr. Um, Avi add um, principle of um, uh, what is the uh, uh, the immune system. The immune system is, is the police that patrols our streets and um, it keeps us from, you know, safe of diseases and, and infections. And I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. 
let me see if I go back here. Um, it's, it's like the police that goes on the streets and then keeps check of everything that goes into our body, all the elements that are in our body, anything that behaves differently, anything that has um, uh, any cells that has, has been infected or behaves differently, the immune system recognizes that and then it tells it to die or self-destruct. And that's how the immune system uh, works. Um, the latest research has uh, found therapies that actually use the immune system to, to help and, and kill the cancer cells. So these are cancer modalities. So how the immune therapy works. Immune therapy uses uh, certain parts of the immune system to um, attack cancer and to uh, kill cancer. So it could be by boosting the immune system or making the immune system stronger to kill the cancer cells. The immune checkpoints are molecules that are found in certain immune cells that need to be activated or inactivated to uh, begin an immune response. And this helps the immune system uh, to tell that this helps the immune system distinguish between cancer cells or foreign cells and normal cells. Uh, but cancer cells, like Dr. Avi says, they use a fake ID. So some of the cancer cells can produce cells or produce uh, substances that actually keep the immune system in check. So a cancer cell uh, to grow needs uh, time and, and it needs to uh, uh, you know, not to be recognized by the immune system because otherwise the immune system will kill that. So it, it makes molecules that keeps the immune system in check. So the immune system does not recognize it and kill it. These uh, immune checkpoints are uh, PD-1, PD-L1, and CTL4. These are proteins that are uh, in the immune system in the immune cells, uh, PD-1 is, uh, is a T cell. PD-L1 is a protein that it, it exists in so normal cells and also in cancer cells. Uh, the CTL4 is also a protein found in some of the cells that acts as a switch off uh, to uh, keep the immune system in check. Uh, therapies that target these immune uh, uh, therapies, I mean these immune checkpoints, um, bind to um, block the binding and then uh, against um, the therapies that target these immune checkpoints can block its binding and boost the immune system re response against cancer cells. The PD-1 inhibitors are the Ketruda, the Obdivo, and the Liptayo, and these drugs are being approved to treat non-small cell cancer, kidney and bladder cancer, head and neck cancers, and Hodgkin's lymphomas. The PD-L1 inhibitors are the atezolizumab, abelumab, and durbalumab. These drugs are being used to treat bladder cancer, non-small cell cancer, as well as Merkel cell carcinoma. The CTL4 inhibitors are the ipilimumab, algeboy, and uh, the tremelimumab is an investig uh, investigational drug that is being is a mo monoclonal antibody that blocks the interaction of the CTL4 um, checkpoint. Some of the approved indicators that we mentioned before for these therapies are the metastatic melanomas, the first line and second line for non-small cell cancers, uh, some of the head and neck cancers, uh, Hodgkin's lymphomas, uh, urotelial carcinoma, and also renal cell cancers. Uh, some of the considerations that we keep in mind as nurses, um, oncology nurses treating these patients on immune checkpoints inhibitors are that these medications can actually allow the immune system to attack normal organs in the patient's uh, body and our bodies. Uh, so it's important to recognize these symptoms and know these uh, adverse events as well as um, 
measure their toxicity or grading their toxicity. Um, early recognition of the symptoms and prompt intervention of the symptoms can allow the patient to receive more therapy and, and, and therefore lessen the side effects and continue with the therapies. Uh, the, the, the higher the grade are these um, adverse events, uh, the worse the patient uh, will do with the treatment because that means that we either have to interrupt the treatment or discontinue the treatment completely. And that's not the goal for these uh, therapies and for us as uh, providers. Um, the NCC uh, recommends um, guidelines to um, assessment for assessment uh, for the patients when are to be um, receiving one of these immune checkpoints inhibitors. And it's important that the patient before receiving the treatment of comprehensive assessment is done. And this is for our nurse, I mean, um, doctors and practitioners. The patient should have a, a, a comprehensive clinical assessment that includes physical examination with history of any autoimmune diseases, including um, infectious diseases, uh, blood, uh, blood work, imaging, CT scans, MRIs, uh, dermatological examination, um, thyroid. It's, uh, it's important to um, know the thyroid, um, any thyroid disease on our patients uh, prior to beginning treatment, adrenal and pituitary, pulmonary assessment, all the PFTs and, and oxygen saturation, cardiovascular assessment, as well as musculoskeletal assessment. This is all before patient uh, starting treatment. And then the monitoring and the frequency of that uh, should be done um, accordingly and repeated every six to 12 weeks or every two to three weeks accordingly. Uh, this table shows some of the immune-related adverse events for um, each of the uh, checkpoints inhibitors and, and distributed in grade one and two uh, immune reactions, uh, immune-related um, adverse events. Uh, one and two, and the second, the, the table B uh, shows the distribution graded three and five. So uh, most of our patients um, experience grade one and two of the adverse events, and for the CTL4, uh, CTL4, which is the epilumimab, it shows a graded um, percentage of our patients re, uh, re, uh, reacting, uh, having a skin reactions as well as uh, gastrointestinal reactions. Um, a little bit less, but again, uh, higher on the PD-1, the Ketudas, the Obdivos, and the uh, um, other treatment. Uh, the PD-1 inhibitor is the skin reactions as well as GI reactions, and a little bit of ultra, ultra, ultra yes, as well. And the distribution for the grades three and five immune reactions, adverse events, it shows a higher grade on the ipilimumab as well. Not so much on the uh, PD-1 and PD-L1. Endocrine and, and gastrointestinal for grade three and fives. Um, these immune-related uh, toxicities are um, is the way to manage for um, uh, the, the different toxicities. Uh, um, the first, uh, this um, slide is for skin toxicities, and this is for our doctors and, pro and, and, and practitioners. For grade one and two skin adverse events, the, the, the therapy should be discontinued for at least a week and then continue with the uh, immune uh, therapy star topical emollients, antihistamines in the case of a pruritus and or topical uh, corticosteroid. For grade three skin adverse events, we should interrupt the therapy and begin immediate treatment with topical emollients. For grade four, the discontinue of the therapy should occur permanently and then consult a dermatologist. Uh, the endocrinopathies, um, this is um, the hyper and hypothyroidism that they can also occur. Um, for grade one and two, the therapy should be interrupted and begin any beta blockers in case of hyperthyroidism. Uh, reinitiate when the symptoms subside. 
in case of hypothyroidism, grade two begin hormone replacement therapy. If thyroiditis, which is an inflammation of the thyroid, um, we should begin prednisone orally, one milligrams per kilograms, and taper down. If hypophysitis occur, which is an inflammation of the um, pituitary, uh, when headache or diplopia or any other neurological symptoms occur, um, prednisone is a treatment, one milligram per kilogram orally and taper down. Begin hormone replacement uh, therapy depending on the affecting hormonal axis also for the thyroid. And uh, in patients with type 1 diabetes, grade 3 and 4, ketoacidosic, uh, admit the patient immediately to the hospital. Immune-related hepatotoxicities for grade, one, uh, grade 2 hepatitis, uh, withhold the therapy and monitor the uh, liver function levels. If no improvements over a week, then begin the prednisone. For grade 3 hepatitis, discontinue the therapy immediately. For grade four hepatitis permanently, discontinue the therapy and admit the patient to the hospital. Gastrointestinal uh, toxicities in patients with grade one diarrhea. Um, ICP can be, the therapy can be continued, but monitor the uh, patient closely uh, with antidiarrheal medication. In grade two diarrhea, interrupt the medication and begin corticosteroids. If no improvements within three to five uh, days, colonoscopy should be performed to rule out any colitis. So the patient can benefit from BRMK or any tumor necrotic factor inhibitors. If severe diarrhea occurs, three and four permanently discontinue the therapy and admit the patient to the hospital. A pneumonitis is inflammation of the lining of the lung in grade one and two. Hold the uh, therapy and rule out any infections and begin prednisone. In grade three and four, pneumonitis is continue the therapy permanently and admit the patient to the hospital. The, um, it could be considered adding Remeke and or any immunosuppressive therapy uh, for in case of deterioration uh, from patients receiving too much uh, corticosteroid. Neurological toxicities include an event of neurological um, adverse events, withhold the therapy and perform MRIs or a scan to rule out and define the etiology of this um, toxicity. Um, if deterioration occurs, the patient um, should be admitted to the hospital and begin immediately the prednisone one to two milligrams uh, per kilograms orally or IV. Uh, Guillain-Barre or myasthenia gravis uh, symptoms occur considered adding uh, plasmapheresis IV or IVIG. A cardiac toxicity, if myocarditis is suspected, admit the patient and, and immediately begin high dose of prednisone again. So in the event of deterioration, consider adding immunosuppressive therapy. For real, real, um, rheumatological toxicities, uh, mild altragias begin uh, known steroidal medications, and if no improvements, consider low dose of steroids. In severe uh, polyarthritis, refer the patient to a rheumatologist. Remicade and another antinecrotic uh, factor um, drug may be required to improve, to improve the, the inflammation symptoms. For renal toxicities, in case of nephritis, rule out other causes of renal failure first, then interrupt or permanently discontinue the therapy. Stop also uh, other nephrotoxic uh, drugs and consider renal biopsy. So because you will see all these side effects that can occur to a patient with this wonderful therapy that cure people to not cure people today, but definitely let, let them live longer with a better quality of life. We see patients coming into the treatment area, either coming from work or going to work after treatment. It's only a 30 minute infusion. The longer is a one, one hour infusion, the patient just come, get an infusion done, no losing hair, no having stuff in their hair because they're bold, not having nausea, fatigue, or any issues whatsoever, so they can get into their car and they drive home or work, and they continue their life. Best ever happened. So it's important that these patients and the families, which is 
is, is the greatest support that they can have. And the example is Jay, that we saw him coming into the treatment area uh, with his wife all the time. It's amazing. Uh, to receive the best education ever, up to date education and, 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 and timely is before the treatment, throughout the treatment, and even after survival, because side effects can occur at any time after the patient begins therapy. So it's important that the education continues, continues, continues. We nurses in the oncology uh, treatment area, infused John area, we spend more time with the patients than anybody else outside, the doctors or anybody. So we get the chance to talk to them continuously, 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 and reinforce of the side effects and how should they um, manage them. Most important is to tell the patients that any time that it side effects occur, diarrhea, any coughing, any shortness of breath, any dizziness, any um, skin issues, any pruritus, anything after the therapy has begun, they need to tell the doctor right away. It could be a sign, it could be um, a, um, a side effects that if it's not noted and if it's not treated on time, it can uh, escalate and therefore the patient next two or three treatments can be discontinued and no benefits whatsoever. So it, it's also important to continue uh, education as well as tell the patient how to uh, keep um, infections control, safety, sexual uh, behaviors, as well as medications um, handling. It's important to follow the doctor's um, prescriptions and, 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 and continue um, practicing uh, safety and, 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 and proper um, handling of medications and, and infection control. I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. Supporting, uh, to support this optimal um, uh, management of the adverse events, the Oncology Nursing Society has an immune therapy uh, wallet card available, which I forgot to bring some with me, but I have a copy in here, and you can get this actually via the website or email uh, at clinical at ons.org. And the wallet card is very, very, very uh, handy. Uh, it, it actually has two parts. The first part, you put the patient's name, the cancer diagnosis, and the uh, uh, agent that the patient is receiving in case you check checkpoints inhibitors or however it is, monoclonal antibodies, oncolytic, biotherapy, however. The, the medication's name, the immune therapy, when did it start it, and all the cancer medications. These the patient care with them because the patient may have started uh, immune therapy yesterday and a week later uh, he's not coming again to our center but he started having diarrhea or having some of the issues and they decided to go to the ER. So they went to the ER and the doctors in the ER don't know what the patient is receiving. They said, oh yeah, I have cancer and I have, I'm receiving chemotherapy. So the doctors don't know and they may treat the diarrhea with hydration and Imodium, and they send the patient home, and the patient goes home and continue having diarrhea, but they don't want to go back to the ER, so they have diarrhea, three to four diarrhea, five, six diarrhea, and they dehydrate themselves, and they get to the point where they come to us and they already de dehydrated, so we have to um, suspend the therapy until the patient gets better. So th that's what we're trying to avoid So uh, with this, with this um, monitoring. Uh, if the patient carries the immune car with them, with the patient and the family members are aware that they should go to any other doctors and tell them, I am receiving immune therapy. This immune therapy can cause organs to fail in my body, so therefore I can have this and this and that. Then they know how to treat them and properly address them, and then the patient can go home, feel better, and then continue receiving the treatment. So that's why it's important that the patient and the family receive the education properly. And for our conclusions, uh, the cancer is a difficult subject. We know that uh, it doesn't matter how old we are or what gender we are or what religions we believe or, or cultural. It's, it's always difficult for anybody. But um, uh, today, the treatments that are in such immune therapies are, are making the patient live longer, 
and, and with better quality of life, which is the goal and, and with, which is what we always wanted to see in our patients. And um, that, is, that is achieved only by, by good education and proper assessments and monitoring of our patients. Uh, also including all the disciplines available for the patients and the family uh, 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 and the families and caregivers and caretakers. Uh, the, the, the nutritionist is important. The, 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 the social work is also important. The, the psychosocial is also important. So including all these disciplines in the patient care is as important as it is seeing the doctor, getting the blood work, getting the MRIs of PET scans done, as well as uh, the immune therapies or whichever therapies. Any questions? Thank you.
Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for taking your personal time to be with us today at this symposium. My name is Alberto Cortez Ladino. I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a psycho oncologist, and I work at Mount Sinai Cancer Center. We basically work with cancer patients, not only from the psycho oncology point of view, but also we manage pain and we do palliative care, which is uh, basically inherent to the, to the profession. Today, I'm gonna talk about the most common symptoms that a patient with cancer develops. Here, the title uh, calls it fear, anxiety, and depression. And you're gonna know, you're gonna learn that this is combined. These symptoms never present uh, isolated. No special disclosures. This is gonna be a very short presentation. <laughs> and my goal is that for those who are not familiar with what a psychoncologist do, basically after this lecture, you're gonna be aware of what type of services are available for your patients and what type of treatments use, we use for, for them. Talking about psychoncology is like drinking from a fire hose, but I'm gonna try to give you a good summary of the symptoms. Psychological and social issues related to cancer were actually not actively studied until about three decades ago. And this aspect is particularly poignant, especially when one recognizes that each advance, as you can see, each advance made by, made by oncologists in treatment methods also develop created side effects and problems with which the patients had to cope. That's why the need for a psychosocial service was, uh, was created. What is psychoncology? Basically, we work in the psychological, the social, the behavioral, and the ethical parts of cancer. Basically, in two perspectives. One is the patient's responses to all these aspects, psychological, social, behavioral, and ethical, and related in regarding to the disease process of the cancer itself at all stages, not only end stages of the cancer, but also while the patient is receiving treatment, also when the patient was initially diagnosed, and the morbidity and mortality related to those, to those processes. Even though the first anti-cancer agent was developed in the 1940s, it wasn't until the mid-60s when we started to see children surviving of, from um, Hodgkin's disease and leukemia. All those uh, changes in medicine increase the mortality, incre uh, increase the survival, decrease the mortality. Most of those uh, cancers were cured. But despite all these advances, we saw that some worries were triggered, triggered also. And the most common was the fear of recurrence, the psychological distress. The patient is already a survivor after these wonderful treatments. But guess what? The fear of recurrence became the sword of Damocles, threatening the patient every single moment of the life to, to hit on the head. We see patients in our clinic telling us every time I have a headache, the first thing that comes to mind is that, is it a metastasis? I have a brain metastasis. If the patient has, let's say, gastrointestinal symptoms, diarrhea, is it recurrence of my cancer? Is it metastasis? The patient has bone pain. Guess what? It's metastasis. One of the things that we do is to help the patients 
not only cope, but to develop strategies and to develop uh, tools to live with this fear of recurrence and actually to control this fear of recurrence. It's easy to tell the patient, you need to, to be positive, to have positive thoughts. That's a little bit more difficult than that. The patient has to develop tools. It's just like riding a bike. At the beginning, the person falls, the patient comes back, the patient falls back again. And after a while, the, patient, the person riding a bike is not only to maintain the balance, but also to enjoy the weather and also to be aware of the dangers around. This is exactly the same process. We accompany the patients in this process. <coughs> the, according to the studies, the higher fear, the highest fear of recurrence is presented in patients with breast cancer, patients after a bone marrow transplant, and can be as low as 5% in patients with testicular cancer. There are some other problems that were developed, and is the long-term consequences and the psychological impact of injuries to the body. Mastectomies, the patient, the body image of the patient. Chemotherapy-induced alopecia, according to the studies, is one of the top three most devastating side effects of the chemotherapy. And guess what? According to the oncologist, it's not even top 10. So we need to help to, to, to be on, on the same page in this setting because this is something, as you can see here, this is something that can be prevented. And uh, these uh, mechanisms, these uh, tools can decrease the chemotherapy-induced alopecia by 75% easily. We have the, those um, uh, tools at Sinai also available for our patients. The most common can, uh, symptoms in cancer patients are basically fatigue in almost every patient. Pain is also a very common symptom. Cancer cachexia, some people call it anorexia, but it has nothing to do with anorexia. It's called cachexia insomnia and delirium. I put depression and anxiety together because you will never see a patient suffering from anxiety without symptoms of depression. Let's talk a little bit about pain. Pain is a very common, especially in bone, either primary bone cancer or metastasis to bone. It's also very common in a GI, gastrointestinal, uh, GU and lung cancers, and patients with leukemia, the prevalence of pain is actually very low. I couldn't talk about pain without talking, uh, giving a few minutes to the epidemic of opioid abuse. Since year 2000, this epidemic has increased by 200%. And look at the numbers, only in 2016, more than 42,000 people died of, of uh, problems related with opioid overdose to the point that as of today, opioid abuse and opioid uh, related deaths became the first, became the leading cause of accidental deaths in the in United States. We recommend to to the staff, to our residents, to follow the analgesic ladder when we're managing pain. Start with non-opioids, and we're talking about cancer patients. Start with non-opioids. Sometimes good combinations of non-opioids can be very helpful, especially in early stages. Uh, which one, sorry? It's the last line. No, non-opioids are the first, the, the baseline. The first line, the yeah, the first line, always. Then you combine those non-opioids, and then you start using opioids, low-potency opioids, like oxycodone, tramadol, all those things in combination with the previous level, meaning uh, 
diclofenac, Tylenol. Tylenol is, is uh, very useful in combination of, uh, with these medications. How these opioids work? We have basically three, the most common three receptors, opioid receptors are the mu, kappa, and delta. And opioids alter the nociceptive information. Nociceptive is basically the, the normal information, the normal transport of information of the pain, and also blocks the circuits. That's why we may feel, we may have the, the injury, but we don't feel the pain because it's blocked in different, in different areas. The medications that block these three receptors, mu, kappa, and delta, depending on where they bind, can be called agonist, partial agonist, or antagonist. For instance, naloxone. Naloxone is a non-selective and blocks every single uh, receptor, but has some, some uh, preference for the mu receptor. And buprenorphine is called a partial agonist because it's a little bit of uh, agonist on the mu receptor, but it's a strong blocker of the kappa and delta receptors. We used to believe that the receptors were located on the surface of the neuron. And last year, they found through these uh, studies from Stober that the opioids that we give not the opioids that we develop, that we produce in the brain, but that we give, the morphine, the oxycodone, all those are actually not gonna be attached to a receptor on the surface, but are gonna be inside of the neuron. That has changed uh, basically the game in the, the way we see the, the opioids in terms of the, of the kinetics and the dynamics. They are different receptors. A word about methadone. Methadone is commonly used not only as a drug of abuse, but also to treat uh, problems of uh, dependence and, and, uh, and pain. It's, a, it's an agonist, opioid agonist, but what is the problem with that? Because it has a long elimination half-life. In a short analgesic half-life, this medication becomes very dangerous to manage. When you want to switch an opioid, a regular opioid, and start using methadone, please decrease the um, equi-analgesic dose by 75 or 90 percent, and never give more than 40 percent, not even in advanced, ca in advanced uh, cases of cancer. Please. If we need it, absolutely. If, you, if we need it, absolutely. We try not to because it's a dangerous medication, it's difficult to manage. But if uh, the situation merits, absolutely. And also my understanding that only certain physicians can give methadone. Not really, I, what I believe is that you need a special uh, permit for buprenorphine, but for methadone, no. I'm not aware of, at least I, I haven't had any problems prescribing methadone. Pleasure. how we recommend to prescribe opioids. Please don't use long-acting opioids in acute pain. And please give, if, you, if you're forced to give opioids, give the lowest possible dose and for the shortest period of time, three days or less, never more than seven days. You need to test the patients, yes, if it's a non-cancer patient, because usually cancer patients are more responsible in terms of the, the opioid use, but in non-cancer patients, and if you need to give the medication for more than six weeks, yes, please, get Utox. And also these um, monitoring programs are extremely, extremely important. That actually seems to, to reduce a little bit the mortality and the the um, dark use that some patients give to the opioids. How often you have to reassess the use of opioids? If you have to give more than 50 morphine 
um, uh, equivalent dose, milligrams equivalent, equi equivalent dose, and never give more than 90 equivalents. You're gonna ask me, but how? There are some strategies, and the most common and effective strategy is please rotate the opioids. Never give the same opioid for three months, five months, six months, because the patient is gonna start developing tolerance. So what you have to do is give eight weeks, 10 weeks of the medication and rotate with equivalent medication. What's gonna happen? The brain is gonna take the first medication after 12 weeks as a brand new medication, as a brand new opioid. And that way, we're not gonna increase the risk of tolerance and dependence on the opioids. We use the e forks Actually, our health record system, EPIC, doesn't let us prescribe, finish the prescription of controlled substances until we review e forks and that is helping us a lot. Antidepressant nation, this is a very good term. Some epidemiological and experimental studies have shown the association between depression and chronic pain, and we have recognized the advantages of some of these antidepressants in uh, treatment of, um, of pain. For instance, the tricyclics in neuropathic, look at the improvement. In the case of Cymbalta for neuropathic myofascial in patients with diabetes, Effexor has been proven to be helpful in patients with diabetes. Celexa and Paxil in neuropathic pain is a, is a very interesting thing, however, most recent studies, studies from the last four years, is a type of study called pain path analysis, have shown that at least, and this is fascinating, at least 80% of the changes in the way we perceive pain and depression is not due to the pain medication. The perception is due to the antidepressant medication. Why? because antidepressants, medic antidepressant medication have anti-pain effects and is a different, attack the pain in a different way. It's not because the patient is feeling better from the depression that the pain is more tolerable. No, the, the antidepressants also have analgesic eff uh, effects. And this is the proof. This wonderful study from the Japanese group showed that patients with depression share a lot of, uh, a lot of abnormalities with patients suffering from chronic pain, speci uh, specifically cancer pain. You see that the images are very, very similar. The um, alteration is seen in the amygdala, the thalamus, <coughs> the prefrontal cortex, but there's one, one specific area that has called the attention of the researchers in, in this sense, and it's called the anterior, what is this? the anterior cingulate area, and the main difference between depression and chronic pain is mainly in the area of the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. There are a different approaches to pain depending on the culture. I'm not gonna show you this video because it's a little bit long, but basically the doctor of the community was hitting the patient. It appeared to be uh, laughable, but guess what? It has a biological uh, principle behind it. Don't forget that pain can mask another pain. This person was hitting the other one and the pain here basically distracted, the pain, distracted from the other type of pain. We use also a lot of um, Botox for um, um, trigeminal neuralgias, for chronic headaches, and uh, other different uh, areas of the body that are affected. Let's talk about cancer cachexia. It's different from anorexia, 
because anorexia means that there's aversion for food. In cachexia, the problem is not the patient has the psychological component, is that the metabolism of the patient is different. In normal situations like pregnancy or exercise, and in cases of um, hyperthyroidism, the metabolism is fast because of the requirements that are coupled with the intake of food. In the case of cancer cachexia, the problem is that the metabolism uses, and I'm gonna show you in, on this slide, doesn't use the regular gluconeogenesis, the, the, the energy producing uh, metabolism parts, jumps directly to burn fat. And burning fat is an extremely expensive, from the metabolic point of view, it's an extremely um, expensive process. That produces a lot of, um, an increased protein kinase A. That's why patients lose weight. From a study, a, a presentation on the, the Cachexia Society in Washington in uh, two years ago, they showed that 62% of the cancer patients going to their first oncological visit, they already have cancer cachexia. The most common, obviously, has to be related to pancreatic cancer, gastroesophageal, and lung cancer. And the lowest prevalence of this type of um, metabolism uh, abnormality is seen in breast cancer. The treatment has been tried. Steroids, megase, antidepressants like uh, mirtazapine, nutritional supplements, cyproheptadine, all those, um, all those treatments at some point can be combined to help the patient. Nausea and vomiting is another very common symptom in cancer patients. We see that this notion vomiting is basically triggered after the stimulation of any of these four, uh, four areas. The central nervous system, the highest uh, centers, the vestibular system, the chemoreceptor area, which is basically located on the floor or the fourth ventricle, and the vomiting center, which is located a, a little bit um, down from that, uh, from the floor of the, of the fourth ventricle. And that is formed by the medulla oblongata and, um, and the chemoreceptor zone. What is the treatment for that? We use a lot of medications, including ondansetron. Ondansetron blocks the serotonin-3 receptor located in the vomiting center that we just saw. But I want to mention the um, seminal work of one of my professors, Steve Pasek at Sloan Kettering, who did the biggest study on olanzapine in cancer patients. He found that olanzapine was actually wonderful medication for our cancer patients because of the side effects. Most of the medications that we know act in one receptor. Olanzapine works in six different receptors. So this is a medication that is a mood stabilizer, helps the patient to sleep, stimulates appetite, is not very good but can help a little bit with pain, and it's possible that olanzapine is superior to ondansetron and the other anti-nausea medications. So it's a, it's a very good option that we have to consider. Downside of that, we have to monitor the heart because just like any other antipsychotic medication or most of the antidepressants medications, these, there is the risk of increasing the QTC, and a QTC prolongation may be a, a, very, a very dangerous situation for, for, for a patient. Cancer-related fatigue. This is very interesting concept because Sometimes the patient presents to your clinic telling you, I'm depressed. Cancer-related fatigue is actually more common than depression in the setting of cancer because the symptoms 
of cancer-related fatigue and depression overlap. And this is related to what we just mentioned. Cancer itself is a hypermetabolic state that obviously produces severe fatigue. The patient feels exhausted and is not gonna get better with rest. The treatment for cancer-related fatigue is also um, but very, very extensive. And there's only one medication that we could never, never um, give for these patients. It's called paroxetine. Studies have shown that actually paroxetine is the only antidepressant that worsens the fatigue. We use a lot of stimulants, Ritalin, amphetamines. Amongst the antidepressants, the list is basically reduced to two antidepressants. One is bupropion, the other one is Effexor. Those are the two antidepressants that have an activating properties. So we give these patients these medications early in the morning to give a boost of energy. What is the downside? Since it's a, sti uh, a stimulating medication, it may worsen the, the appetite. So be careful with that. Modafinil is also um, very used and is a very safe medication in that sense. Not too long ago, the FDA approved TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, to treat these symptoms of depression, anxiety, uh, panic disorders. And it's a wonderful option also for our cancer patients. Basically, we do a mapping in the left prefrontal area with a magnet. When we see a response that is not exactly a seizure, just the movement of the thumb, that's the area, the left prefrontal cortex, that's the area where the, the as we saw in, a, in the, the previous slide, where the depression and the anxiety and all those symptoms can be controlled better. The FDA approved three months ago a protocol in which you need to use the magnet only for three minutes. The initial protocols required 30 minutes. After that, it was dec decreased to 18 minutes, and now it's only three minutes. You have to give it five times a week for four weeks. And uh, we're gonna reduce a lot of the use of medication and the side effects. So this is a safe option that I'm glad to say that Mount Sinai is gonna be the first cancer center on the East Coast um, where this treatment is gonna be uh, used for, for our cancer patients, and the second in the country. The efficacy is better than the antidepressant medication and is close to 85%. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna talk briefly about CVV. The next uh, lecture, Dr. Kuzner is gonna, is gonna uh, talk more about, about this uh, cannabis system. But I just want to present you this option. And I found few well done studies to present you today for anxiety and depression. This study showed that when combined Prozac plus CBD oil at ineffective doses, there was good antidepressant effect. And then when they give, gave the, the uh, animal model the PCPA, which is an inhibitor of the serotonin, the CBA, CBD couldn't, couldn't act. That uh, is a, a very good um, proof that uh, the effects of the CBD in depression are also related to the serotonin system. In the case of anxiety, this is the only double-blind study that I found was a group from Brazil, from um, Albert Einstein in Sao Paulo. They used, they gave to the patients, actual patients, 400 milligrams of, of CBD or placebo. The patients presented decrease in the, the tools that they used for, to measure anxiety. But the way they approached this study was with imaging. And they found that after the patient got the CBD, 
the flow, the cerebral flow pattern was, uh, was improved as an anti-anxiety effect of the CBD, which didn't happen in the, with the placebo. Delirium. Delirium is one of the most common mental disorders encountered in the hospital, especially in our cancer patients because of the um, uh, medical complications. Delirium can be produced by multiple sources at the same time. It can be infection, can be side effects of the medication, can be interactions between medications, can be metabolic um, problems. And the most important key here is that delirium is reversible. If the patient didn't recover, the cognitive function was not delirium, was something else. And it, it is present in about 85% of terminally ill cancer patients in the hospital setting. This is a personal favorite. This is Salvador Dali made a drawing on a serviette of Professor Freud when he was waiting for him at his house in North London. And after the meeting, Professor Freud said about Salvador Dali, now I understand why the Spanish live in a civil war. Thank you so much. Please. Lamictal is extremely helpful in controlling, in, 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 uh, is, sorry, is very helpful in a neuropathic pain. For instance, when the patient has uh, spinal stenosis due to metastasis and, the, and develops this uh, excruciating pain, neuropathic pain, La Lamictal, starting at very low doses, 25 milligrams twice a day can be helpful and that can be increased to 100 milligrams twice a day. But what is the downside of Lamictal? Lamictal, one, produces somnolence. So in older patients, may increase the risk of falls. We don't want that. And second, a lot, no, no, a higher doses. And also, there are some uh, anaphylactic idiosyncratic reactions to this medication. That's why we need to start at the lowest possible dose of 25 milligrams. Pleasure. Any other questions, please? By a who? Uh, can be a psychiatrist, can be a trained physician. Please. Uh, could you be more specific? Well, like the DCT, the psychiatrist would say, what do you do? Because these things vary. The main type of therapy that we provide at our hospital in the, cancer, in the cancer setting is obviously cognitive behavioral therapy because this is a type of therapy that the patient needs to make conscious and at the same time to redirect the behavior in terms of for instance, fear of recurrence. What we do is, I'm gonna give you an example. The patient comes to my office and tells me, I'm afraid that I have a recurrence of my cancer, that I have metastasis. My first question is, what have you told by Dr. Kuzmir? Because no matter what, no matter how advanced, no matter how um, early is the illness, we cannot work with the patients unless it's not based on reality. So the evidence that we use is the recommendations and the evidence provided by the, by the, oncolo by the oncologist and the team. Because what if it's true? Yes, Dr. Kuzner told me that I have metastasis. Okay, so it's a, it's a fact that you have metastasis. Now let's work on the next step. It's very important, your question, because 
few days ago I read a forum and there was a psychiatrist in Europe saying, there's no hope if the cancer is advanced. I'm gonna tell you one thing, there's always hope. It doesn't matter if, he's the, if the patient was just diagnosed or if the patient only has few hours to live. There's also hope at this moment, the hope changes. What is the hope at this stage? The hope is that the patient dies in no pain, not suffering, surrounded by the loved ones. That is also hope. It's not only the hope that, that sometimes is provided to the patients at early stages of the, of the cure. There's always hope. Thank you so much. Try, trying to solve these issues and hopefully be able to entertain some of the, of the different questions. Uh, and really the million dollar question is there's a lot of people using it, but is it really for medicinal purposes? If um, we cannot go onto a medical marijuana lecture without talking on the historical component of medical marijuana. Interestingly, medical marijuana has uh, roots in which uh, are already described in uh, ancient Chinese medicine, where the Chinese uh, healers have the word dama. Oops, one, wait. Uh, you said this one? Yeah. Dama is the uh, Chinese name for uh, medical marijuana. And this is actually uh, the thumb of a um, uh, Chinese healer. And if you see next here in this bowl, when they analyzed it, they actually did find not only the actual uh, seed of medical marijuana, but they actually found the actual pot, which is quite atypical. If you think about Chinese uh, medications and all that, the most common one, and I'm gonna speak a little bit to kind of like show up a little bit of knowledge, is Camellia sinensis, which is known to us as tea, and what we use of tea is the leaves. However, of marijuana, what we use are the actual pods, the seeds, the part of the female plants, and that's what they had in this old Chinese healer burial site of uh, many centuries ago. Fast forward to many, many years, 3,000 years later, and uh, the first report of medical use of marijuana comes from uh, O'Shaughnessy uh, in the literature in the 1840s, where he actually described multiple properties of marijuana as being analgesic, sedative, 
anti-inflammatory, anti-spasmodic, and even anti-convulsivant. Interestingly enough, uh, it was listed as an active medication uh, in 1850, so like 10 years after O'Shaughnessy described it in the medical literature, and it was listed there as a medication until, until 1931. Moreover, extracts of marijuana, like this one, like this one here, and this type of um, preparation, were the number one, number two, and number three most prescribed medications from 1842 <coughs> to 1890, okay? So the amount of use of medical marijuana was huge. Now, there is some problems when we start looking at the way that medical marijuana behaves. The first one is that the actual uh, cannabis plant comes in several varieties. We do have one plant called the cannabis sativa. I keep pressing the wrong button. The cannabis sativa, which is a fairly tall, slender plant, uh, which uh, it's uh, mostly a stimulant, is the one that tends to be related much more to euphoric events and all that. We're going to talk a little bit more on this. The cannabis indica, which is the, the one that is more described as the downer type of um, plant, and a rarely used uh, cannabis ruderalis. We don't know much about ruderalis. It's a fairly uh, not very common type of uh, hybrid. Mostly what we see now in the common preparations are sativa and indica and connotations of both of them in which they mix them in order to prepare some of the different extracts like the one that you see here and uh, many of them that we're seeing now in the common market. What happened at that time? What happened in uh, the 1900s? So in the 1900s, we started to see the development of multiple new medications that were very targeted for those days to certain receptors. We started seeing the opiate approvals when we started to see that there were uh, barbiturates, aspirin, chlorhydrates, and a lot of these medications started to come into play. And then uh, by 1937, Put yourself in the historic context of what, of what time we are living at that time, and that's a point in time when prohibition was coming to an end, okay? And they started to need some new targets, and that's where Congress came into power with Harry Einslanger, one of our famous congressmen, uh, that he picked marijuana as his next target as prohibition was coming out of his favor, and he was a famous prohibitionist. So he started to kind of like target marijuana as his next level of um, uh, substance to be prohibited. Uh, 1937, they decided to start taxing $1 per ounce of medicinal use and $100 per ounce of recreational use of a substance that was widely available all over the market and fairly used. The American Medical Association was the actual only institution to oppose to those restrictions because they said this is a drug that is being used, reported, and medically and scientifically validated. Uh, and at that time, Einslanger was able to push for restriction of future investigation and the least marijuana without any clinical evidence and without any issues of toxicology that they were ever able to put in 1942 completely delisted. In the act of Congress, when Harry Einslanger put to be kind of like banning marijuana, and just again, put yourself in context of how would it look if Congress would pass this now, and it's actually taken from the extract of the Congress session where marijuana was delisted. It reads, marijuana is, one of, of the, is the most violent causing drug in the history of mankind. Most marijuana smokers are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. I don't know which one of those groups I want to belong to. I'm, I'm probably, yeah. Uh, 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 their satanic music, jazz and swing, results from marijuana usage. <laughs> this is taken from the actual act of Congress where marijuana was delisted. So this is not something that I just wrote or that he said in a speech. This is said in the chamber of one of our most beloved institutions of this country, or we will say, I don't know. Uh, by then, we keep... Fast forwarding, 1970, the National Institute of Drug Addiction 
started asked to be tasked with the um, kind of like asking the, the public, how do we classify drugs? What's a schedule one? What's a schedule two? Where do we put drugs as drugs were coming into, into being abused? Because again, 1970s, this is the era where people were abusing drugs. And the National Institute of Drug Addictions create two schedules. Schedule one, where it says a drug that is for a potential of abuse very high, medicinal use no, and not proven even under medical su uh, su um, uh, supervision. So a drug that has no use whatsoever to be used in any other circumstances. And then schedule two, the ones that still have a high potential for abuse, but they do have medicinal use, even so that they may generate dependency. Look at the drugs that are listed in Schedule 1. Heroin, LSD, mescaline, GHB, and marijuana. And in Schedule 2, morphine, which at the end is a derivative of heroin, fentanyl, which is a synthetic form of heroin, amphetamines, codeine, etc. So that's 1970 when we were. Now, the federal law, what does it say? It still passed the Controlled Substance Act by 1970, and it made no distinction, which is still the federal law of this land up to, up to this day. Federal law still is this one since 1970, where there is no distinction between re recreational and medicinal, with up to one year of prison and 100,000 of the first offense and possession, and up to five years in prison and 250 for cultivation and distribution. There's a lot of people from the 70s and the 80s that for repeat offenses and all that, are still in jail out of, my, uh, out of marijuana um, cultivation or anything like that from these days. The Supreme Court actually had a case on this where they said that the medical need is not an excuse to break the law, and this refers to marijuana by itself. And this was 2001. We're not that far from today. So this is where we are sitting nowadays, and the FDA reaffirmed in 2006 that marijuana is not a medication. And I'm happy to tell you that we're fighting already this. We have uh, precisely with one of the, uh, the um, uh, boots that are exposing today an IND, an investigational new drug application with a number already for a use of a cannabinoid derivative extract for the use in cancer patients that it's moving through the process in um, in the current um, year, actually. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that the modern medical use, and we're gonna start to get now medical, uh, there's an old program in which they took 100 patients eligible to apply for medicinal use. There's still some of those patients still receiving these cigarettes from the government as part of the program of the investigation uh, even though that the program was terminated in 1992 due to the high number of applicants. The problem is that NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Addiction, is the one that has been sending these cigarettes to the patients. This is actually the leaves out of a cigarette uh, that came out of one of those patients. Again, I told you that the Chinese healer had pots of the female marijuana plant, and look at what the people are getting from the National Institute of Drug Addiction. Stems, leaves, and a bunch of other stuff that God, know, God, that God knows what that makes. If I tell you that I'm gonna make a study of alcohol for something and I prepare a wine out of leaves and stems of the vine instead of the grapes, how many people will drink that wine? So that's where our government is standing up to this moment. By 1985 and 1992, the FDA approved a synthetic preparation uh, of dronabinol, marinol, uh, for the use in cancer, cachexia, and HIV patients, for nausea, vomiting, and weight loss. Uh, Dr. Cortez mentioned on these topics. Uh, since then, there's been two other drugs, um, Navalon, um, and then uh, Raymond Band. Uh, the study actually was interesting. This one, and I'll talk a little bit on the, on the way that it works, but if you're talking all the time, you, you hear all the time that I'm talking about cancer, weight loss, appetite simulation, the munchies of people that smoke marijuana and things like that, why can I not get a synthetic drug the same as what they did with dronabinol and make a synthetic uh, medication that will block those receptors so I can lose weight, so I don't get appetite? Great idea. There's a big, big problem. When 
Raphael Mechulam in uh, Israel described the internal receptors of marijuana in the brain that we do have. We have those receptors of cannabinoid substances in our brain, and he described that they exist. The person that describes the receptor has naming rights, and he put to the receptor anandamine. And anandamine is the actual substance, and it's a Sanskrit term that it was used to refer what marijuana produced on the people when that receptor was stimulated, meaning in Sanskrit of anandamine, pure bliss. Guess what happened when we block that receptor synthetically to try to lose weight? Suicide. That's the problem. So that's the reason that nobody has had the great idea of blocking it anymore. And you see that everybody talks now of all the other effects, and nobody's thinking like, hey, what happened if we do it on the opposite direction? How's it going since then? Let's talk. 2006, the FDA already did certify it. What happened since the FDA said it's not a medication? It's nothing. Don't keep doing it. It's crazy. It has become the most common illicit substance in the general population. By 2011, 7% of the patients have referred that they are chronic and common users of marijuana. People over the age of 18 to 25 refer that have used it at least in 19% of the uh, overall populations, and 48% of the general population had said that they have used it at some point in their lives for one reason or another one. We're talking, ask the same question for alcohol, and you may get numbers that are not that different of how many people have used alcohol for one reason or another one. Now, why are people using it? People are using it still mostly for fun. 47% of the patients refer that they just use it for fun. Um, again, no different than alcohol, probably. 30% uh, uh, have been for only medical reasons, and 23% it has been mixed. Now, what are the medical reasons that we use it for? Pain still is the number one reason. That's actually what we're conducting the study at Sinai. Sinai, we're going to be conducting a study of chronic opiate users from cancer pain to see. We know that the patients that have chronic cancer pain, the pain keeps escalating as the cancer grows or anything is happening. And we want to see if with a preparation of a cannabinoid, we could keep the narcotic dose stable. Now, you would say, like, you're changing one drug for another one with the difference that the drug that I'm changing is a drug that causes many side effects like constipation, sedation, delirium, for a drug that might cause some other stimulating effects like euphoria. And when we see grandpa in a bed that doesn't want to stand up because of my chemotherapy is giving him fatigue, as Dr. Cortez uh, mentioned earlier, then sedated from the narcotics and all that, and I give him something that decreases the amount of requirements of pain and then stimulates the patient, it might be a desirable, eff a desirable effect. But it's still used by the same token for insomnia, because I told you, sativa is a stimulant, but indica, it's a downer. It a, it's a, it's could be used as a sedative. It is phenomenal. I have used it in a lot of my patients, and it is great when the patients have that level of anxiety and that they cannot go to sleep to use some of the cannabinoids for insomnia. It is great, but then keep going down the list. Nausea, it is also a great medication, and even for depression, as uh, we were talking um, earlier. Now. What are the reasons or the chronic medical conditions? And this is an old slide, and I'm sure that it has changed dramatically. Only 1.5% of the patients that were using marijuana in the 90s and, and early 2000s had cancer. That being said, when in 1991 they surveyed oncologists and asked if they have ever recommended marijuana to one of their patients, 44% of the oncologists, 1991, said that they had recommended. I can tell you that now that number is probably 90 to 100%. That at some point you say, like, come on, give it a shot. Okay? Um, now, there's a problem. We walked into a dispensary, and this is pictures from an actual dispensary in California where they sell some of the marijuana hybrids, and this is what you find. No difference than Starbucks. So you walked in, and you've got the... Blondie, French roast, whatever, but, but you have all these type of things, and if I ask somebody that doesn't really know what they're going to get, if I tell you, like, okay, I would like you to go and get some OJ Kosh, Girl Scout cookies, things like that, you, you're, you're going to look at me like, what are you talking about? 
So, and it's difficult, actually. I, I haven't been recently to the experience of, of needing to secure, let's call it, some product from California uh, for my mother. When I called my cousin that is an OBGYN in California, and I said, do me a favor, go to the dispenser. I need you to get me a sativa one-to-one -one ratio at 14 milligrams. I gave him all the instructions, and the guy was looking at me. He's like, yeah, I walked in, and the guy told me, well, I got Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> and, and I said, let me, let me figure out which preparation do you have, and it's not that easy. And, and the menus are extensive. The, the menus are extensive. I, I can tell you, it's not simple. The, the second problem is that we always talk about the main components of marijuana. We always talk about the cannabinoids in marijuana. The cannabinoids in marijuana are this amount of what it's actually on this pot, which is the actual part of the plant that we use for extraction and all that. There's over 400 chemical compounds and the highest concentration in those resins uh, tend to be of delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoid, uh, but there's 70 additional cannabinoids. And the delta-8, which is an, a, a different type that ends up uh, converting in the liver, it's completely, completely different. But the balancing between those cannabinoids, and I'm gonna show you in a second what happens, as well as the terpenes and the flavonoids, are what really end up giving you the actual components of what you end up enjoying, using, or medicating from the plant. If I tell anyone here in this room, I'm gonna put two bottles of wine from the year that there was an absolute drought in California, that the wine, that the grape got dried like crazy, they're super bitter, horrendous wine, it's $10 a bottle, and the next year when, when there was flooding all over, super sweet grapes, those grapes, the bottle is $100, same wine, right? Same, vi same vines, same grapes, same winery, and same extraction. That's a problem. The same happens with these plants, and that's the reason that control situation of how do we grow all these marijuana supplements, it's an art, and it's not that simplistic. Um, the cannabinoids, the usual one, when people talk about high THC and low THC, they're talking only about the nine tetrahydrocannabinoids. That's when they say, oh, that's a low THC or a CBD or a hemp plant, which is from the family, but not, a can not really cannabis. That just means that they have low 9 delta tetrahydrocannabinoid. But CBD is the cannabidiol, which appears in some other plants, such as hemp. And you could have huge amount of hemp, full spectrum of a lot of the other substances. CBG is super active in a lot of uh, medical um, applications, but different plants, again. Okay. Now, what's the biggest problem? In the liver, when we ingest cannabinoids, the hepatic metabolism converts that 9 uh, tetrahydrocannabinoid, the delta 9, into 11 hydroxy tetracannabinoid. That oxidation ends up being excreted in urine and feces with a half-life that is super fast of 20 to 30 minutes. That being said, if it's smoked, and I'm gonna show you the difference in between ingesting it in a gummy bear edible or smoking it, because this is liver metabolism. It's called the first pass for the ones that are medical savvy, uh, and it happens very different. CBD, the cannabidiol, it's what regulates that. It's kind of like the, the one that ends up moving the metabolism of the of the THC from one side to the other one. And there's actually two type of receptors, CB1, CB2. They're in different places of the body, including the immune system. It's very interesting, and I might want to pursue later some studies of immunotherapy and cannabis, because actually macrophages have cannabinoid receptors. And as we're talking of immunotherapy and cancer, I don't know if there was a lecture of immunotherapy earlier, it is actually quite interesting in the way that this re receptor, mostly the CB2, might interact with immunotherapy. Uh, it is also an activator on the, on the liver, and the way that it works, and this is kind of like a cartoon showing on the presynaptic level, uh, that as you go, let me see how this, yes, as you go into the, into the postsynaptic function, the CBD and the uh, cannabinoid receptor end up blocking, so no more, no more tetrahydrocannabinoids reaches the point. So you could almost have as an antagonistic effect, and that's the reason that having a good balancing between the two of them makes a lot of sense. And you regulate one with the other one. 
So when you see preparations that are super high in THC, super low in, th in CBD, you might end up losing that that is very, very actively regulated in our bodies, in our brains at this specific moment. I'm hoping because since the cannabis is the um, pleasure part of the receptor, I'm hoping that this lecture is being some, somehow pleasurable so that you're getting stimulation of this receptor. <laughs> but regulated by these other receptors so that there is not that amount of euphoria so that people are not dancing like hippies during the lecture. Okay? So that's more or less the way that these receptors kind of like interact. But that's only two of the 400 compounds. And the, all the other components of the plant, we have not been able to study that well. Um, and this is actually present all through the brain. It's in the basal ganglia, the motor activity, when the people, the, the, I remember I had a classmate in school that we used to, to call the Muppet, because he was all the time like, grooving and all that, that he was getting a lot of his basal ganglia getting stimulated. The people that get the munchies is getting it through the hypothalamus. The people that feel like, oh my God, it feels so great. They just got their nucleus accumbens stimulated. And it keeps going on and on. Even the short-term memory and the coordination. Uh, but you see pain at the dorsal aqueductum and all that. And the one that is of my interest at this time, CB2 immunomodulation. It might have a role that we have not studied at all. What are the problems? So everybody's saying like, oh yeah, it, it sounds great. The next thing after uh, sliced bread, is there any problem? There is some problems. The first problem comes that a lot of these receptors are not fully developed up until the end of teenage years. There is a syndrome that has been described on kids that use marijuana or any of the, or the, of the deri uh, derivatives. Bear in mind that actually I used the term marijuana, that it was a derogatory term that also Congress used to put it kind of like a Hispanic name. Uh, and it, it, they were trying to make it the connotation that it was not good, but it, it became quite common now. But in the uh, preteen years, that development of that reward mechanism has not been fully developed. And there's actually a few syndromes that have been described in pre-teenager years at which if they use marijuana to a certain level in those years, they lose those reward and pleasure receptors and they become what we call in psychiatry anedonic, that nothing gives them pleasure and it's been very widely described. And that's the reason that we do believe that high THC preparations should be kept to a certain level out of the reach of pre-teenager years, pre-teenager. We're not talking even teenagers, we're talking pre-teenagers. So, I don't know, I think that, that that's something that it's important, okay? Um, the uh, non-cannabinoid effects that we were talking, it does have an interaction with the mu and kappa receptors uh, that are also part of the, of the receptors of the pain uh, system. That again is what we're looking, the, there's activation in, uh, in uh, nicotinic receptors that uh, interacts with heart rate and things like that. I'm gonna talk about that a, a little bit. And there's a lot of other effects. Again, the ones on the immune system, uh, but there's even proliferation of prostaglandin that it may even stimulate the amount of even gut epithelium for patients with mouth sores, mucositis, and all that stuff. We're trying to figure out exactly what's in each one of the preparations, and, and um, there's a lot of technology that we've been able to now analyze what is on the different dispensaries in the different uh, states where it's completely legal, and even here in Florida, and you can find out exactly what's the percentage of all the different things and the total amount of cannabinoids that they have, but the pot that we are seeing now, the marijuana that we're seeing now, is not your dad's pot. What the people used to smoke in the 60s, that they would just grow uh, in their gardens and things like that, the amount of THC average of the concentration to what we are seeing now in 2007 has really gone exponentially high. And that's problematic. I don't know if it's completely good. It's good when we concentrate. But if I take a bottle of wine, and I keep using wine as a reference because it's an easy com comparison, I could distill wine to the point of making it into cognac every single time. How many people would want to have a bottle of cognac every single night with dinner versus a bottle of wine? Yes, it's great, it's, a, it's of higher potency. It's of different use. And I don't want to get everybody alcohol at the 50 and 
70% proof when you can enjoy wine at the 8 to 10% proof where it's where wine stands. And that's what is changing in marijuana. So they really have worked to grow it different. And it, this is actually quite interesting to me because you, you see a lot of the marijuana growers and all that, and they kind of like say, you know something, this is a green industry, this is non-genetically modified. Not really. They really have been modifying it like crazy. They've been increasing the concentrations to levels as high as 20% on the plants. The pharmacokinetics, meaning how the drug behaves in our body when we use it, it is also different when we inhale it. So they inhaled marijuana products, and this is something that has not been fully studied with oils. This is when we talk inhaled, we're talking of the leaves, which now in the state of Florida, as of two weeks ago, is legal. Now we could tell the patients, go to the dispensary and buy the actual plant and smoke a joint. This is what these studies are. The, bio uh, the bioavailability means that 50% of the dose is being absorbed, getting into the patient's body. 50% gets exhaled out of what we call the dead space. The concentration, you can see that it's really, really high in minutes. And then it's super close, as if we would be giving it IV. This is amazing. There's very few drugs that you could inhale and get this curve that IV marijuana versus smoking marijuana gets to a level that it's that close. And repeatedly, repetitive doses do not really keep increasing the levels because the receptors get saturated. And as you repeat the inhalations, intervals of one and a half hours, of, of doses of two, four, and six inhalations get to the same level. And the inhalation of the actual uh, resin, the pot, the hashish, however you want to call it, even if it's not a joint, even with these fancy volcanoes, which a lot of my elderly patients prefer to use than just uh, smoking a joint. And the, um, the amount that you have to volatilize it, so how much do you have to light it? Because a lot of people say like, oh, maybe I could just warm it up a little bit in the room with one of those uh, diffusers and all that. Marijuana needs to be decarboxylated in order to release the resins, which means 140 uh, degrees Celsius. That's actually something that all the people that have worked a little bit with the product know that they need to really raise the temperature uh, up to the point of 140. When you keep passing 140, you do not extract tremendously much more to temperatures of complete combustion, meaning burning the leaf completely. So if I, if I take a bunch of marijuana and I throw it into a fire, there's a point when I start losing some of the other substances and concentrating the THC no more, okay? So it, all that you need is really decarboxylation. Orally is very different. The gummy bears, the brownies, whatever you have uh, heard about it, nobody has used them, but everybody has heard about them. But the, the bioavailability of those, different from the one that I just showed you, that it's minutes, 20 minutes, or something like that, when you inhale it, when you ingest it, it takes, first of all, third of the drug gets degraded in the gastric lumen, only 5 to 20% gets absorbed, and the concentration peaks one to three hours later. This is a problem because the kids in college that want to experience and to try it, take a gummy bear, that doesn't do anything to me. Let me get another one. That didn't do anything. Let me get another one. Let me get the whole packet. And then two hours later, they're stuck to their bed like, ooh. <laughs> the, the, because that's when it peaks. While if they would just smoke it 20 minutes later, they will be in anandamine, in pure bliss. The, the second problem is that they, look at this, the elimination might take up to 25 hours. While the elimination of the smoke, it takes somewhere around two hours. So the effect is much shorter. You, we've seen a lot of people that I've consulted with even on, on different levels that have been actually in high productive industries where they say, I need to get a pass to be productive. I need the, the, to get to this meeting, get to this uh, brainstorming session, and they use it for a production level, and then they keep going on. Is it healthy or not? I leave for others to judge. Not my field of expertise, but that's kind of like where we are. Doses are important. And the doses, we consider a low dose less than 7 milligrams, an intermediate dose, which is what we use mostly in our field, 7 to 18, and a high dose more than 18 milligrams. And if you remember the slide that I showed you, that the current pot is not our parent's pot, 
most of the preparations are coming now in 20s. They're all coming in, in more than uh, the higher dose. And the tolerance, meaning when do you kind of like stop getting an effect, it's much more if you use low and chronic doses. So the person that says like, oh, let me get a pass of maybe a little bit, seven milligrams, eh, not much, let me keep getting it, let me keep getting it, they're never gonna get it because they're saturating the receptor at a chronic low level. While the person that uses a medium to, to a high dose just once for whatever they need at that specific moment and they don't, they don't use it on a chronic level, they're gonna be fine, okay? But even the, when you look at, and I keep taking labels, I'm a label reader all over, You're like the people that know me in the office, even when, when I'm meeting that I always turn things around looking at the labels and all that stuff, but when you look at the labels of marijuana, this is what you're getting, that, that if you get a bag of actual uh, plant, you're getting 20% THC on a net weight of an eighth of an ounce or 3.5 grams. And that's all that you're getting. This will probably last several, several days to a person, while this chewable, 50 milligrams in a single dose. It's huge. It's a lot. And that's actually what we're seeing. We're seeing that in the, in the pre-rolls versus the different uh, cookies and oral preparations, Look at this, I couldn't find a dose of an edible in a dispensary that I took this list from. Then this is old, this, is, this has to be at least a year old or, or even two years. I couldn't find any that was in intermediate levels of the edibles. Everything was high because everybody thinks that more is better. And that's not the case with this. Now, what are the pharmacodynamics? What happens to the patient? Because the patients will ask me, like, what am I gonna feel? They do get an elevation of the heart rate. There is a little bit of tachycardia. Again, the nicotinamide receptors that I told you earlier, the subjective euphoria, which could be good, could be bad. They might decrease alertness for some patients. There's motor stability. And in males, it decreases luteinizing hormone, follicular assimilating hormone, prolactin, and growth hormone. That could be very good because it might increase also testosterone levels. So those levels are mostly female hormones, the growth hormone. In females, they actually have an increased sensitivity to THC and they actually end up have, having increased levels of estrogen. There's a lot of studies of vasomotor events and things like that to see if they could be mediated by the amount of THC, but also, again, so in, in males, it might stimulate the testosterone production and in females, the estrogen production. Quite interesting that it varies that much in the type of uh, stimulation. And, and the models are reproductive of all the different levels that you could see on the heart rate of for how long does it last. And this is quite short, it's, it's actually four to six hours with a heart rate that didn't really peak more than 120, uh, feeling high, weed inhaled, it never lasted more than eight to 10 hours, even after repetitive doses. This is repetitive dosing and the alertness also decreased. Now, what is the toxicity? Because I've been telling you a lot of the good things. Is it toxic to the person? I show you in teenagers that there could be some issues. What is the toxic level of THC? Nobody has been able to find it. There is no toxic level. If you look at the toxic level of other substances, look at alcohol, the toxic level for a ratio of a fatal dose to an effective dose, when the kids do the 21 shot when they are, when they are becoming to an age of drinking, that we wish that they drink at 21, I don't even know why, because when we started drinking at the age of 12, but that's different. But, but, <laughs> but, the, but when the kids do those shots and they drink 21 shots at one because they, are you one, are you two, are you three, and they took 21, there's actually deaths reported from those 21 shots, which, are, which actually are a bottle and two extra shots. So when they drink a bottle of whiskey in 21 seconds, there's kids that die from alcohol overdose because the dose is here, 10. Oral alcohol dose to a, fa to a fatal ratio is 10. The dose of marijuana, it's not been reported. That is the reason that deaths from alcohol and so deaths for cigarettes are all over our we're cemeteries and we're still waiting for the first marijuana death. <laughs> there's not been reported, not ever. Looked in the literature, looked it up, and there's never. Now, the second question is, because I had this discussion with one of my partners in my office. He said, that's a stepping stone. The marijuana person will use marijuana, will want to have something bigger, then they would want to have something more, and they would like to step into more. So is there a potential for dependency? that the person will say, like, I cannot function because I have not had my puff and my shot of marijuana today. This is the lifetime risk of dependency of a person from marijuana. The lifetime risk of a person that takes a cigarette, one, 
cigarette and says, let me try it, is one in three. 32% of the kids that say, let me try a cigarette, let me try a jewel, let me try one of those garbage things that they're selling nowadays, one in three. Heroin, 23%. Alcohol, of the person that says, like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm liking this alcohol, and that's the reason that we want to keep our kids from trying alcohol until late, like if that would help at all in dependency. But 15%. 9% of the users. I showed you earlier that 48% of the people in the country have said that they have used marijuana at some point in their lives. But the number of people that are dependent on marijuana, that they say, no, really, I cannot get my eye opener, my day started without getting a shot of marijuana, making one quick pass and then going to the office, or finishing my day and relaxing with a, with a, with a dose of marijuana, only 9% the lowest of all the substances, and that still is listed as a Schedule One. okay? Um, is there potential for research? You name it. I think that there is potential for research in all the different fields. It's got a lot, a lot of different things that we would love to see. Uh, there's a lot of approved already preparations from anti-seizure to Tourette syndrome. Uh, there's some ongoing clinical trials, most of them are still ma mandated by NIDA. When I applied to the FDA to get my IND with the, with the marijuana preparation that we're trying to do research, it was the second only ever in the country to be applied for from the FDA. I said, until now, until this year, if I wanted to do research with marijuana, I had to get first, before getting to the FDA, an application through the NIDA, the National Institute <laughs> of Drug Addiction. And I said, you know something? The heck with it, I'm gonna try to circumvent the NIDA and apply through the FDA directly, and we did it, and we already have an IND number, and we're moving ahead, and it's going to be one of the uh, further clinical trials. But the data still is something that we would like to see much more, even though that the uh, early studies of placebo uh, for neuropathic pain and things like that, of just a few puffs of marijuana, are amazing, are unbelievable. You look at these curves, and you see the placebo curve versus the low and intermediate dose of marijuana doing unbelievable. And you see, you don't need the high dose. You, you could get, just go even with the light dose for neuropathic pain without getting tremendous amount of the side effects of feeling high, stoned, impaired, or anything like that, and, be, oops, and still um, being uh, coordinated. This is kind of like pegboard testing and things like that, and that the patients were able to do it. Uh, there's several studies that have been done to the same level, and if you were to see at what we call the number needed to treat, how many patients do I need to give marijuana based on only these two studies? That's just a quick calculation of the number needed to treat. I will need to treat only three patients with marijuana to see one benefit, to see benefit. While if I would be doing it with serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Paxil, Soloft, and all that stuff for neuropathic pain, I will need to treat double the amount of patients to see any benefit. The interaction with opiates, which is what we are planning to do our research, it appears to be that it's synergistic, so I could decrease the opiates because of that synergistic uh, effect on the mu receptors that are the ones for pain, and as well as um, being able to even decrease some of the other things. The euphoria that some people describe as a side effect, I don't see it as a side effect. I may see it as an, as an actual beneficial effect. It's not always an adverse event to be euphoric. In cancer patients being euphoric, it might be a beneficial uh, thing. And then a single treatment that increases appetite, decreases na nausea, improves pain, sleep, mood, and has some other potential use is something that we might want to be using it. And that's part of the reason that there's even studies now uh, the group from Spain is even looking at the anti-tumoral effect. There's some studies mostly with glioblastoma. Since I show you that there's a lot of receptors in the brain, the, the group from Spain is saying that they may have some data that some uh, preparations may decrease the growth of the cancer. Uh, some cancer cell line studies have also shown in colorectal, um, as well as some uh, mouse studies. I this, I feel it's pushing it a little bit. And again, I think that the different preparations are not much. Uh, like two years ago, uh, one of the duo from Chick and Chong decided that he was going to treat his <laughs> prostate cancer with marijuana, with the well-known Samson oil. And I always say, like, for whoever has seen his movies, 
if marijuana would be the cure for cancer, he would not have got it in the first place. Yeah, because he probably was getting it quite a bit. Um, but it, last year when I made this presentation at a, at a symposium somewhere else, I sat down and I did a literature search and I pulled the terms cannabis and there were um, 16,000, almost 17,000 articles on cannabis in PubMed. PubMed is kind of like the database that we use for articles. When I crossed the words cannabis and cancer, there were 517 publications. And when I only looked for clinical trials, there were 19 clinical trials, most of them of a handful of patients uh, that it was really um, not something that we can, that we can do. Uh, but the, the problem is that the, the botanical dosification, and that applies to all the integrative medicine. When I talk botanically in the office, dosification of a, of a botanical preparation is complex. This is, it's way easier to give an 81 milligram aspirin than to give a extract of elderberry prepared in 5% glyceride, let it steep for the, for the last two weeks, and then extract to the maximum concentration at the peak of the season. Uh, it's a little bit different. And the variety of hybrids, as I show you on the, on the menu from the dispensary, it's difficult. It's even difficult to standardize because, again, the preparation of this year may not be the same one of last year. And uh, inhaled is difficult. We've seen patients that when we give them an inhaler for asthma, they may as well use it for hairspray because they're getting as much in their lungs as if they would be using it for hairspray. Uh, there's still a lot of contamination with pesticides, microbiology, chemicals. There still is the psychoactive effect that might be problematic for some patients. And one of the biggest issues is that still is not patented. It's very difficult. You cannot patent a plant. You could get some amount of patents on some extraction, but the actual plant is not something that you can patent. And it's not something that is going to be changing. Regulation around the, the world is changing. This map is super old um, uh, of all the countries in the world where it's legal medically, recreational. It is changing by the minute. Even here in Florida, the laws are changing. I was uh, one of the first 200 physicians certified by the state of Florida to prescribe medical marijuana. And at that time, we had to take this class that it was eight hours, that it was the most ridiculous class that, it, that anyone could imagine uh, until amended, Amendment 2 passed and they allow us to start prescribing. We are now part of this marijuana use registry, which it's part of the concern that people get concerned that they're getting their name out that they're marijuana users and the actual consent form that the state of Florida still requires. And that's the reason that I cannot prescribe it at Sinai, that I need to refer the patients to an outside institution is because the current consent that the Florida legislation passed, it says that since the patient is being using a schedule one substance that by federal regulation is still considered an illegal substance, if they are ever involved even in a car accident, they are resigning of their rights of being even insured that the ca I, I w I'm waiting for the case to come of a cancer patient with medical marijuana that gets into a car accident and their car insurance company tells them like, oh yeah, nice to know, but we're not paying because you're on medical marijuana and that's a federal control substance and your accident was while driving under the influence and your policy does not cover you while the influence of an illegal federal substance. We're actually reporting you to be taken to jail. I'm waiting for that case to come. But that's a problem because we're still in the limbo of the two places. Um, the, the, the state of Florida still has some approved conditions uh, with, again, the, the conditions could be as chronic non-malignant pain, so back pain still is included or anything like that. And for physicians that want to be certified like myself, we have to pay $995 to take a ridiculous eight-hour class of somebody that doesn't know half of what half of the people that are taking the class know. This is quite interesting. My medical license is $500. I have to pay $500 to, be, to practice medicine, to prescribe chemotherapy, which is a little bit more toxic than <laughs> marijuana, but $900 to prescribe marijuana to the Florida Medical Association, which is a political institution, part of the American Medical Association, which I don't want to get into, into the process. But, but again, the, the problem is in a lot of the different things. It's still, I would need to consent the patients to make them sign for all these things, which is much more than what we ask patients to sign when they are submitting their, uh, their lives to chemotherapy or to any other substance. And then at the end of the day, if you were to compare 
Coca-Cola and marijuana, you have uh, the active ingredient, THC, sugar, and high fructose corn syrup with the healthcare risk of obesity, lower immune system, dissolving bone, uh, teeth, leading cause of childhood diabetes, obesity. It is addictive. High fructose corn syrup have a, uh, extremely chemical additives. They do have artificial coloring flavor sweeteners. Uh, doctors do not recommend it, and they recommend zero soda consumption, and it is sold in public schools. While the marijuana, it's good, it's got no hangovers and no carbs. <laughs> so the, the, at the end of the day, the summary of this lecture, if you, if you were to say, how does it go? 2,000 years before our days, they used to say, here, eat this root. Then 1,000 years, they said, that root is heathen. Here, say this prayer. Then 1,850, they said, that prayer is superstition, it's doing this potion. 1940, they said that potion is snake oil, swallow this pill. By 1985, they say the pill is ineffective, take an antibiotic. And by the 2000s, they said the antibiotic is artificial, eat this root. And with that, I'll be more than happy to take any questions or any further comments. Thank you. How do I monitor the. So, so by the. First of all, why do I need to monitor? This is so, so, and the first question is, do I need to really monitor the use of medical marijuana? I would like to monitor is that it's kept away from kids that are in pre-teenager uh, years, but otherwise, I'm, I'm not that much. The state of Florida does make you monitor uh, when you prescribe medical marijuana that you have to be submitting the plans and submitting the prescriptions in a certain interval that you know that the amount that the patient is using is not much more than what the patient was recommended to use and they keep track that you actually have to submit those papers to the University of Florida in Gainesville, and they are able to track if the patient is really being using it and having a benefit. I monitor is the beneficial effect. I monitor is I tell the patient, does it help? And again, nothing is 100% in life. So I prescribe marijuana to a lot of the patients, and they tell me, no, I didn't do squat. I'm like, okay, let's try something else. So I monitor is the effect, but I don't monitor really the use. If the, per if the person tells me, like, I'm enjoying this way more than I should, I'm like, enjoy it. <laughs> and the what? Again, the problem is I cannot prescribe it legally at Sinai by the current regulation, but I do prescribe and I recommend it, and I tell the patients to get it from the different sources that most of my older patients, I just tell them, tell your grandson to get you, and it takes like 25 seconds for the kid to say, like, hey, hey take it. That. <laughs> just like, yeah. But, but yeah, I just recommend it that way. Yep. The, the, way, the way that I see it, and, and as Yogi Berra said, I don't like to, pr to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, but, the, but the way that I see it is that my feeling is that it's going to come into the, into the point of becoming a much more available substance and almost an over-the-counter in the future where the, um, the FDA is going to get some certain preparations that are going to be much more specific, very well controlled to become an actual medication where they will be prescribed uh, as a probably scheduled two at that time. But we are going to be seeing a movement on the recreational market and on the availability, as it's happening already in several states, Massachusetts, Colorado, um, Oregon, California. There are several states where you could get off a plane, walk into a dispensary, and just buy whatever you want. That, what I see that is going to be happening, and, and I see it just based on the business movements that have happened. Recently, the um, main... The owner of the brand Corona bought a participation in one of the main marijuana businesses at a 10% of the business to try to start probably infusing some alcohol with marijuana products and things like that. And it's going to be moving like in, in, into a much more faster level. If, I, if you think about what I just told you and keep comparing it with alcohol and things like that, a kid now in college gets his fake ID goes, gets a bottle of booze, he has to share it with 20 other friends. They finish the bottle of booze and they said, like, this is such a waste of time and we paid $200 for that fake ID. Because nobody got even 
a little bit happy with that bottle that they all had to share after getting that with the fake ID. They get a beer of Corona infused with marijuana and they're gonna get the bus right away and that's what the alcohol industry might be looking by investing in this, in this product as well. So it's gonna go in both ways. It's gonna go on the medical side. I think that we're gonna see much more reproducible preparations that we're gonna be able to find out in our clinics that we're gonna say, let's try to use this, even if it's just the botanical preparation, but of a very controlled, specific production mechanism. And we're gonna be getting the recreational movement much, much more. The, the, the biggest fear, I think that it's going to be coming from the alcohol industry than what is coming from the FDA or the pharmaceutical industry. I don't think that the pharmaceutical industry has tremendous fear of marijuana. Perfect. Thank you.